All right, welcome everyone to the ninth annual UVM Business Pitch Competition. Um, my name is Eric Munson and I'm from the Grossen School of Business. And before we get started, I want to thank a few very wonderful people that we have with us today. Um, first, I'd like to begin by thanking, thanking all the folks at UVM who have helped to sponsor and support this annual event. Um, this includes folks from the Grossman School of Business, including Linda Kruger, Edward Yan, Heather Garrow, and Nick Ingro. Um, it also involves important folks from the Rubenstein School of the Environment and Natural Resources, such as Dave Kaufman, who has helped provide us with the teams from the Rubenstein School, to Tricia Schrum from the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences in the Community Development Applied Economics Department, as well as Dustin, Dustin Rand from the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences in the Mechanical Engineering Department. I would also like to thank UVM's Office of the Vice President of Research, our UVM Entrepreneurship Club, and the UVM Foundation, who will provide invaluable support, both personnel and financial, to this event. But most important for this event, beyond the presenters themselves, are our five expert judges, who include, and I will stop sharing my screen so they could potentially share their faces, just a moment here. Uh, these include uh, Sarah Kearns, who is an advisor at the Vermont Small Business Development Center. Sarah, could you turn on your video for a moment? Oh, I show it as on. My apologies. That's all right, Sarah. OK, we're having some difficulties here. So you'll have to at least hear Sarah's wonderful voice. Um, in addition, we have Sam Cutting. Oh, there we have Sam Cutting, who is the president and owner of Dakin Farm, and he's a 1980 alumni of UVM. Thank you very much, Sam. My pleasure. Uh, we also have Hannah Wood, founder and executive director of Talent Skate Park, uh, class of 95. Hello, happy to be here. And we have Wendy Nunez, uh, class of 1985, who's the partner and chief operating officer of Champlain Investment Partners. Hello, Wendy. Hi. Thank you for having me. And we have Glenn Gottfried, class of 1977, who's a principal and co-founder of South Branch Capital Partners, LLC. Hello, looking forward to the presentations. Thank you very much. All right, I will start sharing my screen again so we could wrap up the intros. I would also like to give special thanks to a number of other alumni sponsors, including David Aronoff, class of 1986, who actually gave the initial endowment, which made this whole series of business pitch competitions over the past decade possible. I would also like to thank Richard Bass, class of 1966, and his daughter, Lauren Bass, class of 2020, in our Sustainable Innovation MBA program, who have all made extra donations to make this event possible and to raise the size of our prize pool. We also have a number of community sponsors who have made uh, financial contributions to this event. These include the Moulton Law Group, who is a boutique law firm that focuses on advising business clients, investors, and entrepreneurs in a wide range of business, legal, and financial needs, especially in the small business and market here in Vermont. Uh, we would also like to thank Michael Lee of Reconciled, who unfortunately could not be at the event today, but Reconciled is provides online bookkeeping services for entrepreneurs and small business in Vermont and across the US. And we also have Scout Digital, who designs, manages, and produces powerful marketing systems that launch and grow incredible organizations. So to get to the event, there is, once again, since we don't have physical programs, I thought I should quickly share with you the agenda. Between now and 440, we will give introductions and thank yous. Then we will move on quickly to the first six pitches. Each team has seven minutes to present. This is a hard seven minute boundary. Um, during the time people are pitching, I will ask everyone to turn off their mics and cameras, except for those people who are pitching, because we want to see your faces while you're pitching. We want to hear your voices. And at the six minute mark, I will turn on my camera, and that will be the signal to you that it's time to start wrapping things up. And then as we get closer to the seven minute mark, you'll see me waving my hands wildly in my screen. So you'll know it's time to stop and at seven minutes, I will specifically stop you. And then the judges will have about three and a half minutes 
to ask their questions. It'll be a little bit harder for me to, to stop the judges because they're such amazing people, but I will do my best so that every team will have the same amount of time in terms of presentation and questioning. After the first six pitches, we'll take a five minute stretch and bio break, approximately from 545 to 550. Then we will have the second five pitches. And following the five pitches, the judges will go off into a breakout room, a secret location, virtual location where they will confer to determine the winners. We will then also have, for the folks who are still here in the room, and I encourage everyone to stay because we have a wonderful panel discussion where we will have uh, three panelists. We have Eli Moulton, who's the founder and managing member of the Moulton Law Group. We have Emily McMahon, who's the director of marketing at Scout Digital. And she has also in the past run a large business pitch competition here in, U in the greater Vermont, uh, greater Burlington area called Launch VT. And we have Ryan McDevitt, also a UVM student, but he's the founder and CEO of Benchmark Space Systems, uh, pro uh, innovative developer propulsion systems for Cube satellites. So we have an interesting mix of panelists. Um, the judges will be conferring on, they will be deciding on five different prizes and the people at the event will be dividing on a, a sixth prize. The judges will determine first four, call it second prizes or best of awards, which were, have $5, $500 each as a prize. There's the best pitch, the most launch ready, the most sustainable, and the most innovative technology. And then out of that pool of four best of awards, they will pick the grand prize winner for the event. In parallel, what I will manage here on my, for the folks who stay in the room, we will have a People's Choice Award where the folks who are still there, will I will put a link into the chat. I will also share a QR code on the screen so that everyone who's participating can then vote on which of the 11 teams excites them the most. You know, should get that extra audience vote prize. So without much further ado, I would like to move up first, introduce the teams we have. Here are the first six teams. I'm specifically not saying which unit of the university they're from because I want them to surprise you with that information. But sometimes it's really hard to tell what school or college at UVM they came from. I think that's a really cool surprise. Um, so the first six teams are Lightning Blaze, Echo Boutique, Bloom, Streets, Hopeful Healing, and Glass Healing. And then after the break, we will have Carefree, Blue Room, Pitchfork Marketing, Able, and Repurposed Music. And I'd like to ask Maura and Abby from Echo Boutique to share their screen. Thank you guys for your time. Sounds good. All right, I'm good to go. Just let me know when. All right, let's go. The fashion industry is the third highest polluting industry. The world consumes 80 million new pieces of clothing a year. Out of those 80 million, 85% of them end up in a dump. Not to mention that this industry accounts for about 30% of the microplastics that flow into the ocean. My name is Maura McDonald and my business partner's name is Abby Hansen, and we're here to talk to you about Eco Boutique. Eco Boutique LLC is a sustainable fashion boutique based out of Burlington, Vermont. We'd actually be the city's first, and we're here to fill the expanding demand for ethically sourced, eco-friendly fashion. So we'd be catering towards women and would offer a mix of new sustainable sourced clothing and unique thrifted secondhand garments. We'd have a brick and mortar location on Church Street, as well as an online store powered via Shopify. So as mentioned, I'm Abby. I'm a sophomore here at UVM studying public communications and parks, rec, and tourism. I'm really interested in marketing and connecting with the public. My name is Maura McDonald. I'm a sophomore here at UVM. And I'm majoring in environmental studies, and I came up with this idea by having conversations with the girls in my retail job about how we feel a lot of guilt buying clothes, and there's not good sustainable alternatives for people our age. Data on the sustainable fashion industry. In 2019, this industry was valued at $6.3 billion. With a compound annual growth rate of 9%, it's projected to grow to $8.2 billion by 2023 and $15.1 billion by 2030. We've all heard that retail is not the best place to be right now, but there are two areas in retail that are succeeding, and that would be thrift stores and sustainable fashion. We happen to offer a blend of both. Although there's been a little bit of a dip with COVID, both of these areas are rapidly expanding and we want to get into that niche as soon as possible. Looking at already established 
sustainable clothing stores, we were able to identify three key problems. The first is a majority of them are online only. This means customers can't try on their clothing and shipping for returns and orders is a hassle, making it hard for shoppers. The second thing we found is most in-person stores are either all thrifted or all new. When shopping sustainably is ideally a mix of both. And the third and most important thing that we found was that a lot of big companies do a thing called greenwashing. Greenwashing is when corporations label or market their products as sustainable, but there's little transparency transparency on the quality of these products, and they're actually not as sustainable as they claim. So that's where we come in. We aim to fix these problems with our market position of sustainability, adaptability, and accessibility. We want to make sure we offer what we call an interactive shopping experience. This means a welcoming shopping environment, styling health, a good atmosphere. We'll have online options for ease, and we plan to offer a genuine commitment to the earth. No greenwashing here. Competition. Sorry. <laughs> on Church Street, there's no boutiques that are solely focused on sustainability. So our competitors are actually the big corporate brands like Free People and Earthbound, who actually do the greenwashing that we previously mentioned. As far as the thrift store goes, the Vault and Battery Street jeans are our biggest competitors. But like we said, there's no new sustainable clothing, so customers can't always find the size and style they're looking for. Our biggest competitors are online. These are previously established eco-friendly retailers with an online presence. Everlean, Eileen Fisher, and Tantry are just a couple of examples, but these are marketed towards a much older demographic. That brings us to our target customers. Eco Boutique is looking to serve women from their teens to their 30s. This group of women have a high interest in fashion and sustainability and are willing to spend their money on self-expression through clothing, not to mention they're a completely underserved market in the sustainable fashion realm. We chose Burlington as our location because we felt like the culture here already has sustainability embedded into it. So the tourists, students, and residents who will come shop on Church Street would be willing to spend their money on sustainable clothes. That being said, we have an aggressive three-pronged marketing uh, strategy to reach these demographics. Being young people, Maura and I are both well-versed in social media, and we know that accounts and advertisements on the major social networks will be the best way to reach out to people. We also know that tourism is such a big part of Burlington's economy, and we aim to lean into that with local publications that will appeal to both residents and tourists. Additionally, Church Street Marketplace offers advertising as part of the lease, so we plan to lean on that. And we know as a small business how important customer loyalty and word of mouth is, so that's also embedded right into our marketing strategy. Our operations and management. In our operations, Eco Boutique will emphasize efficiency, problem solving, and sustainability. Our store itself is going to be around an 800 square foot retail location on Church Street with our online store powered by Shopify. Our equipment will be sustainably thrifted furniture and our technology like cash registers and computers are selected for cost and endurance. As far as labor goes, this is a co-owned operation by Abby and myself with the possibility to hire staff further down as we see fit. We've talked a lot about sustainability, but what does that really mean? Well, there's a couple different areas in sustainable fashion. As for newly produced clothes, you have low carbon, organic, fair trade. You also have used or regenerated things that are recycled, thrifted or secondhand. And we've already identified a list of US-based wholesalers that meet one or multiple of these criteria. Sustainability isn't just part of our brand, it is our brand. Long-term growth. We believe that our key to success is that we have found a niche underserved market. And with genuine and authentic conversations about where our products are sourced and their environmental impacts, we think we'll be able to have a loyal customer base. Not to mention, it's the best time to get into the sustainable fashion industry. Climate change is a prevalent social issue that everyone's talking about. Goals look moving forward. We're looking to move into a larger storefront as the store expands, hire more staff, and expand to different cities who we find have the same values that we're able to find in Burlington. So how do we make that happen? Well, both Maura and I will contribute $15,000. We've secured a short-term small business loan for an additional $10,000, and we've already secured an outside investor to supply the last $15,000. This will cover the cost of goods for our first quarter, marketing, lease, and equipment. Um, using foot traffic data, projected increase, and other similar boutiques, we've estimated revenue for the first year to be $83,000. We anticipate a growth to $107,000 by our third year, given our marketing and the projected increase in the market. Eco Boutique's mission is to provide clothing that is environmentally sustainable and meet the shifting needs of our customers, investors, and the planet. Thank you for listening, and we're open to your questions. Judges.
I would start off. I missed the, the last round. I wasn't quick enough. Um, I'm a retailer at Dakin Farm. Uh, really always focused on uh, direct to consumer and retail, both in bricks and mortar and online. And for me, um, one of the keys to success in making money is margin, turn, and ticket. And you know, you you flash those financials really quickly. But um, I think I saw like a, a 50% margin. Is that what you're looking for? There you go. Thank you. Um, is is that correct? That you're looking somewhere around 50% markup from your yeah, customers? we're looking at a 50% markup. Great. And um, you talked about 83,000, so you have some kind of idea on the turn that you're going to get. Um, what is your average order approximately? Have you thought about that? You you have a PNL, so probably you did. Yeah, so we actually split it up into um, different seasons, especially for clothing. It is really seasonal. Um, we looked at the foot traffic provided by Market Street. They have a whole online um, source and we looked at those traffics and it varies a lot because I'm sure if you've worked in retail, you know that January and February is really, really slow. So our like flows and our prices for our buying times, they do differ between what season it is. Um, so there's not an average one that goes across all four. We really took the time to break it down monthly, which is on a much larger financial suite that I don't unfortunately have out. Well, I commend you for all that. I think those are key factors in, in making a business successful. And I'll get off and let someone else answer, ask a question. Thank you. I have a quick follow on. I just wondered, you mentioned online and uh, brick and mortar. I just wondered what you were thinking about for a, a sales split, where you expected to see the revenue fall between those two. Yeah, absolutely. So the same source we looked, we um, looked at information that was provided by Church Street vendors and found that 20% of them get more um, of their purchases through the online, while an overwhelming 80% get theirs from their brick and mortar location. So we are looking to really push our in-person location and hope that um, through the tourists and the students that our online retail will grow eventually. Thank you. I guess I'm trying to understand what exactly you're selling. Is it, I saw that you were marketing to teens up to 30s. Is this, you know, jeans or is it a more higher end? Is it business casual? What are you um, looking at to do? Yeah. Um, retail, retail is not, it is not an easy um, place to be, especially since what you mentioned, everyone can try things on. If they don't like it, they send it back. All their shipping is paid for free. How are you going to battle against that? Yeah, it definitely is a little bit of an uphill battle, but right now what we're looking to sell is really like jeans, pants, blouses, dresses. We also found that um, like workout attire is very lucrative, um, especially it's really big in the sustainable industry. So we're hoping to provide that as well. And then seasonal changes like bathing suits, which is also a huge part of the sustainable fashion and sweaters. Um, it's not going to be like too business casual. It's going to be for like everyday life. And we think that that's important. We know that clothing is a huge form of self-expression for a lot of people in our generation. And we want people to be able to do that sustainably. And are the price points that you will have at your store because of that a lot more than you would find at a regular retailer? Yeah, the prices are a bit higher, but we were going through Church Street and looking at our competition and stores like Free People have tops for $168. We're able to, you know, you know, 128, 168 pants around 200. We're able to stay in those lines, but have sustainable alternatives. All right. Thank you very much, Mara and, and, and uh, you know, Abby from Echo Boutique. Let's give them a round of applause. I need I need a I need a, I need a, a clap track here. All right, next, um, Emma Ritson and Rusty Sugg from Bloom LLC. And if everyone else could turn off their cameras, like Scott Hutchins, if you could turn off your video, that would be great. Thank you. All right, Emma, Rusty, the floor is yours. Awesome. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. 
Wonderful. Okay, so hi, my name is Emma and with me today is my co-founder Rusty Sugg of Loom Packaging and we provide the most sustainable packaging options for competitive prices. So like all of you, we struggle with images like this, natural ecosystems littered with plastic waste that will be on earth for longer than all of us will be alive. And also like you, we struggle with the fact that statistically, both of us produce 200 pounds of plastic waste every year along with every other American. We take steps like other citizens to reduce this waste by recycling, but it is known that less than 10% of the plastic waste we generate will be actually recycled. Even with steps in place like recycling and PLA compostable plastics, the problem still isn't being solved. If we continue on this path, by both of the time that we are 52, there will be more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish. So three months ago, Emma and I sat down at a networking event through CDAE. We're both community entrepreneurship majors. We both realized that we had entrepreneurial drives, but wanted to have positive social and environmental impacts through the work we did in our lives. We couldn't stand how almost every day and with almost every product, American consumers like us are faced with a choice of either contributing to the plastic problem or sacrificing their favorite products. We decided that surely there must be a solution for companies to package their products and material that won't pollute our planet, even if it ends up in a natural ecosystem. This is when we decided to start Bloom Packaging. Bloom is a hemp-based, home-compostable plastic alternative. We have decided to start our company by producing yogurt and dairy industry containers. And once we are established, we aim to provide sustainable packaging options for a multitude of products and industries, and even eventually offer customizable packaging options. So imagine a consumer in the yogurt aisle at the grocery store. Every option in the entire store but one will be on the earth for their entire lifetime. Neither they nor the company that they are buying from have to contribute to this plastic problem in this industry again. So due to licensing, regulation, price, and many other factors, for Vermont companies, it is nearly impossible to use anything else but packaging for their product, or for plastic packaging for their products. This is neither the fault of Vermont companies nor Vermont consumers who both just want to make the most sustainable choice. This is why Bloom offers extremely marketable hemp-based packaging to Vermont companies that has the same functionality as plastic with the ability to decompose in a consumer's backyard in just a matter of weeks. So there are many other compostable plastic manufacturers in the industry that use polylactic acid or PLA in their formulas, but these PLA plastics need industrial composting facilities with lab-like conditions to fully break down and less than 10% of these compostable plastics actually end up going back to these facilities, and the rest is left on earth and has the same effect as regular plastics. And six in 10 consumers are willing to change their purchasing habits to help reduce negative impact on the environment. The added sales, marketability, and clear conscience is what we provide to our end user and the businesses we sell to. So hemp is one of the most useful fibers in the world. It's stronger than steel by its weight and can be used to make everything from concrete building material to paper. Hemp grows incredibly well in Vermont and the rest of the Northeast and requires minimal inputs like water and pesticides when compared to almost every other crop. In Vermont, there is currently an abundance of hemp. Many farmers across the state grew hemp to sell the CBD facilities thinking that this industry would take off. The industry didn't take off as anticipated, and as a result, many Vermont farmers are being forced to hold on to their hemp due to lack of demand. This surplus of hemp has brought the price down to almost nothing in the state. The strength and versatility of hemp combined with the abundance and low price makes this the perfect time for Bloom to establish itself in the packaging industry. To start, our target market will be organic prepackaged food companies that currently use polypropylene number no. five plastic. The way we see it, the more companies that use our product, the better. More sales equals less plastic in the end. We don't plan to exclude anyone regardless of organic certification, the contents that they package, or what type of plastic they use. So Bloom will operate under a business-to-business -business model, and we believe that selling in bulk at competitive prices is the best way to turn the quickest profit and have the best possible positive environmental impact. So the current surplus of Vermont hemp has made the price so low that when the two of us reached out to a CBD extraction company to see how much they paid for their hemp, they said that they had to pay to have their fibers taken away and that they and many other companies would give it to us for free. So we ended up getting more than enough free hemp to make our prototypes in a matter of minutes. 
And this leaves our cost of raw materials incredibly low to start. And the process of making our products is really simple and only requires a heat press that an open source company in the Netherlands has already developed. And the blueprints are online and parts can be ordered from a local hardware store. So in the first year of operations, we will mainly focus on proving our product. We aim to visit farmers markets and small businesses and provide samples for them to test our product with. This will help us establish our brand and create a customer base before moving on to bigger companies. So we're asking for $30,000 in return for 20% equity in our company. We will turn a profit in the first month of the third year of operations and at the end of the fourth year, investors will make their money back and receive a 10% return on investment. We have projected our finances from the start date until five years out. If anyone here is interested in looking through our financials, we've been more than willing to go over those more in depth with you. Bloom has the potential and the drive to provide any style of packaging that Vermont companies and consumers need. To start, Bloom will focus mainly on Vermont dairy products like yogurt and sour cream containers. This is especially exciting because hemp can be combined with milk curds to form an even stronger plastic. We hope to capture 20% of the Vermont dairy packaging market. Anyone who is involved in the dairy industry, including our distinguished judge, Mr. Sam Cutting of Dakin Farm, knows that a large portion of dairy products are wasted and that dairy farmers across the state are looking for ways to sell this waste. Bloom plans to offer products in the future that are customizable by companies themselves. Multiple Vermont companies like these shown on this slide are interested in our product. We have already created a prototype of a home compostable four pack holder mold that was developed for Havoc and Grow and Fell Meadery. Investing in Bloom packaging is the first step to offering Vermont companies and consumers the most sustainable packaging option for a competitive price. So when considering investment options today, think beyond the pale. Thank you. Judges. This is Glenn. Uh, what's your estimate of the actual cost per container compared to the current costs that the uh, yogurts, et cetera, and companies are incurring? That's a awesome question. So the uh, through market research, we looked and saw that yogurt containers cost anywhere um, from about a nickel to 25 cents, depending on the type of plastic. Um, we're going to be selling um, in different bulk deals, but the average cost per unit that we're selling is around nine cents. And um, it's a good margin because it, at the beginning, our uh, costs are, we're assuming, are going to be f uh, free. But we recognize that eventually there's going to be a demand once these companies start seeing, um, or there's going to be a price increase once companies start seeing a demand for this. Um, and the average price of a ton of hemp is about $300. Um, and we can make about 640,000 units um, off of one ton of hemp. So the margin is is really good. Will your machine that you're talking about make those 640,000 units in a, a time efficient manner? Yeah, so uh, to start where in our in our financials, we have uh, we have eventually just said to starting with the farmers markets and whatnot, that's just going to be Emma and I. Um, and in year three, we eventually have th uh, five employees and um, we uh, we will be able to produce um, um, the uh, the six hundred forty thousand units. Yes. Do you think you might outsource production at some point, or do you, or would you like to own the equipment to make the larger volume? I think uh, as of right now we would want to keep that just in our realm. Um, but depending on how much we expand and how many years that takes, uh, we would definitely consider outsourcing. Thank you. Do you know how many of those uh, those Stonyfield yogurt containers that you showed in your presentation, do you know how many they use each year? And also I was wondering, even though I know it's kind of phase two, did you reach out to any bigger companies and were you able to get any, you know, just feedback on your idea? So two questions, how many containers and did you get any feedback from bigger companies? Yeah. We have not reached out to large companies like Stonyfield, but we have reached out to local Vermont companies and the local Vermont companies are the ones that we're going to be targeting initially 
um, as we're getting started, we want to partner with, like we said, farmers market um, organizations and smaller businesses to really get the ball rolling on testing out our products and creating that brand awareness. Um, and then we'll expand out. But I think definitely um, as like we start, um, we're going to want to get in contact with those larger companies to kind of just put our name out there and um, have them recognize kind of what we do and then hopefully expand quickly to them um, as we as we expand the company. And to add to that, um, the packaging director and CFO of Grohenfell Meadery are uh, going to watch this recording and we have a meeting with the packaging director of Ben and Jerry's next week. Great. All right, Thank you. On that positive note, let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. I thank Emma and Rusty. And now I'd like to welcome, uh, if they could stop sharing their screen, then I would like to welcome Mitchell, Max, Kevin, and Clark from Streets to the to the tank. Hello, everyone. All right, whenever you're ready. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be presenting our company, Streets. We believe, believe in eating the best. Our goal is to provide the most genuine and personalized local food experiences experience for our customer. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our team. My name is Mitchell Hutchins. I focus on sales, human resources, and growth for our company. I'm joined by my coworkers, Max Seckler, who focuses on finance and budget allocate, allocation, Clark Stevenson, who's in charge of marketing and events, and Kevin, who's our data analysis guy. Our company Streets is creating a web platform and application that allows a customized experience for travelers and food enthusiasts that help them find new and authentic local food. Too many times we found ourselves in a new city searching for a place to eat and just gone to a big chain restaurant like Chipotle, but then realize we're missing out on the great authentic local food that a city has to offer. Streets creates value for our customers by combining a social platform with a review site. Most review sites are simple. You search a restaurant, you see a rating, an unreliable review from people you don't know. Streets is different. You search a restaurant and then you see details and pictures of the restaurant and you see what your friends and your network have been saying about that place. This allows you to trust the reviews you see and have a better restaurant experience. You also have the ability to explore new restaurants that your friends have been going to that you've never even seen before. Streets reduces the time spent searching for a restaurant and gives you the confidence and location you choose. To go into more depth on what makes Streets different, we look at the social aspect of our app. It works like this. John reads a review and goes to restaurant X. He loves his experience so much, he writes a review on Streets and shares it with his friends. One of John's friends is traveling to that same city and sees John's review that he left on Streets. He goes and checks out that restaurant and loves it and then writes a review himself. This cycle continues bringing value to our customers by knowing and trusting the reviews they see on our app. When it comes to our competition, Yelp is the biggest name. Yelp has made most of their money advertising for businesses, and we intend to do the same while also maintaining the trust of our users by advertising restaurants to them that appeal to their personal interests. Our competitor in the beer review industry, called Untapped, capitalized on consumers' desire to try the newest products. Streets intends to make that a point of parity for our business model. As you can see through the illustration on this slide, Streets intends to bypass our competition by focusing more on the social dynamic of the food reviewing experience. Next, let's talk about our customers. Our users are college-aged food enthusiasts and young travelers. They value positive experiences over possessions, and they love sharing those positive experiences with those around them. Streets was designed with these values in mind and was crafted to be a source of reliable and genuine food reviews that our customers will trust, will not waste their time or their money. On the other hand, we at Streets acknowledge that our users are only half of our customers and that the local businesses we promote are the other side of our customer base. We intend for the Streets application to be a, med a medium through which each of our customer groupings can relieve each other's pains. Our key stakeholders outside of our organization are going to be our investors, our users, the local government, and the Church Street Marketplace. When it comes to user experience, we wanted to create some mock-ups of what using our product would look like. In the first picture, you can see a login page. To take away from the pain of creating a new login for every app that you download, we have made it so you'll be able to log in using your social media. Next, in picture two, you can see our app will have a map feature that will allow users to be able to view the closest restaurant near them. And it will also be able to show the apps while you scroll through the map. 
Lastly, as an incorporation of our social media, we wanted to have our users have the ability to take photos and share it with their friends. While the app, mo or while the app mockup was non-functional, we decided that we should create a working website prototype and have our target market give feedback on the features. In our findings, 60% of respondents mentioned that they specifically liked the map feature that we input, seen in picture two. The social media aspect, as seen in picture one, re was received with a lot of praise. 80% of the interviewees initially stated that their trust, or they trusted their friends' taste more than strangers. And after reviewing the website, 100% stated that they liked this feature and would use it. As an addition to the social aspect, we would also make it possible to like, comment, and share posts about restaurants similar to social media platforms. This can be seen in picture number four. Uh, while we got a lot of great feedback, we were limited at the features we could add based upon our web making abilities. Streets generates revenue in two ways, advertising and verified user accounts. Our advertising scheme is based off the average revenue per user measure. We create our own industry average by averaging Yelp, Instagram, and Facebook's ARPU data. We set out about $26.80 of ARPU for streets, growing about 4% per year. We predicted that our strategic rollout, we will double our users every year until 2023. This forecasts us to a top line of over $640,000 by year three. Streets has a free user platform, causing the majority of our costs to be fixed. Some of our biggest cost drivers in the first three years were salaries, accounting for 83% of our costs in the first year, followed by advertising and software. We believe that investing back into our company as much as possible. As a result of our forecasting, we project that we'll just make under $25,000 in revenue in our first year and going up to $275,000 by year three. We plan to roll out streets over the next 3.5 years to the following places using our ambassador program. The ambassador program is used to across our entire rollout. It's where we will target college students, young working adults, and influencers to use our social media connect connections to bring people to our platform. The first rollout location will be in our hometown of Burlington, Vermont. We believe it's the best place because of our connections and understanding the local area that'd be the best place to start. Secondly, Boston with over 3,000 restaurants and schools like Boston College, BU, and Northeastern will allow us to integrate into our target market and field test our ambassador program in the first big city. Following Boston's success, we will enter New York City with a massive population of over 8.5 million people. This will mark a major milestone for streets. And after one year, we will then release the nationwide applications of the ambassador program. On top of this, we plan to work directly with social media companies to integrate streets as a cross-functional platform. Thank you for listening. Please scan our QR code to see an app prototype. We will now take any questions. All right, judges. Thanks. Thank you. Um, this is Wendy. So I'm not clear, how would you get paid for people using streets? Well, Wendy, um, one of the basic revenues of that we kind of talked about before was something called average revenue per user, which that's basically based off of how much exposure a basically a user when they're opening up their the site, because um, we have paid advertising within the site, we basically outsource that to other advertising companies and they pay basically for amounts of seconds of exposure within the site. Generally, Instagram, Yelp, and Facebook, they have different averages depending on how long people are physically using the app. So we decided to make an industry average comparing on what we actually produce as a social media, as a mix of social media, and then a mix of a food review site. And we came up with our own average based off of the estimate of number of users we have over the first three years. I hope that clarifies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question. So if you want to reach travelers and your local app, how do you um, advertise to them? How do you people coming into the area? How do you let them know about this great product? I realize that you will do the social thing with other colleges and so forth. But what about the traveler? And and I didn't see you know your PL. We don't need to go to your PL, but um, how much did you budget for advertising to get people to get lay eyes on your app? And, and how will you do that when when they're coming from out of the area? Yeah, so advertising is going to be the big step and uh, be able to get people on our products. So we did, um, when setting up our cost structure, we did make allocate a lot of money to advertising. And, um, you know, social media um, is going to be our number one, as, as we said. But um, in terms of actual travelers, I think also um, going off, uh, you know, 
other things like airports and stuff like that um, is going to be our next focus. Okay. I'm curious about your name. How did you come up with it? And are you worried that people are going to have a hard time when you say streets not doing EETF? <laughs> Well, yeah, it was basically a mix of uh, we want to talk about integrating um, basically local food was our was one of our biggest pitches. Like as Mitchell said, one of our one of the, our own pet peeves that we enter a new city, we're at a new place and we don't know where to go. Um, so it's kind of understanding the area around you, understanding the streets. And then we wanted to have something along the lines of eating local. So we tried to basically mix the words and we came up with the name streets. Maybe we can change the spelling or I guess the definition of the street and the eats to kind of make it look more <laughs> differentiated as a logo. But uh, as of now, that's yeah. we have to get the ball rolling. That's the one thing I don't, I don't think that. we considered the uh, yeah. <laughs> people misspelling it. But um, no, it's, it is super creative, but that would be my my fear. It's all in the name, right? A rose yeah. by any other name. Thank you. Being in the Vermont food business, I, I really think you have a great concept. And um, I think there's opportunity maybe to work with the Agency of Agriculture and other Vermont groups um, to get some free exposure, you know, to, and, um, you know, I, I think it's um, just got to get the word out there. You know, that's that's my big concern. I know with Yelp, you know, they're contacting us all the time to try to expand what we're doing. But I think in Vermont, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good environment because we're so into our food and, and buy local. And um, there's definitely resources in the state of Vermont to help you out. Thank you. Absolutely. And those will be our next steps in this as well. Yeah. Yes. Targeting restaurants and then getting getting the name out and having those local connections is really important to us. All right. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, time is up. Let's give them another round of Bye. applause. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to um, invite Jillian and Charlie from Hopeful Healing. Hello. You guys all see that? It's warming up. It's there now, yes. Awesome. Are we all set to go? Whenever you're ready. Perfect. Hello, everybody. My name is Jillian Goodnight, and I'm accompanied by my partner, Charlie Carpenter, and together we created Hopeful Healing LLC. Hopeful Healing LLC is a luxurious wellness retreat company in Ashland, Oregon for upscale middle-class health seekers ages 21 and up. Hopeful Healing uniquely incorporates the use of psilocybin therapy, yoga, and plentiful outdoor activities that promote psychological growth and mental and physical well-being. Due to COVID, the world's depression, anxiety, and overall mental health rates have skyrocketed. We hope by providing access to holistic health techniques, guests will tra transfer these skills to everyday at-home practices to improve their overall health. Psilocybin therapy is known to cure many health issues from depression, addiction, to even cluster headaches. We are excited to create a safe environment to guide people through psilocybin therapy sessions and change engraved thought patterns or negative behaviors. Our location is a pre-existing facility that we would rent. It is the Green Springs Resort in Ashland, Oregon. Oregon is perfect for our business as it is a secluded and tranquil environment with easy access to outdoor recreation. The lake is only a nine minute walk from the property and their hiking trails begin on site. Our financials are specifically calculated based off the price of this location. Now, Charlie will discuss the industry. So Hopeful Healing will be operating within the wellness tourism industry. And currently the wellness tourism industry is globally valued at about 640 billion and is expected to grow to 919 billion by 2022. Additionally, the United States leads the world in wellness tourism expenditures at $241 billion annually in revenue. With clinical trials of psilocybin use yielding positive results, we are confident that we can establish Hopeful Healing as a leader in the industry as it begins to grow. Consumers within the wellness tourism industry are also expected to spend 178% more on a wellness retreat rather than a typical vacation. This means that our guests will be willing to pay a premium price for our unique and luxurious service. In terms of our target market, like Jill stated, it's for adults 21 and older, but the most lucrative market segment will be those within the ages of 25 and 35. We've chosen this market due to a higher disposable income 
and a change in consumer tastes. So to elaborate on changing consumer tastes, research, research has shown that wealthy travelers recently have turned away from the nightclub and party vacation scene, and instead they have turned towards prioritizing their mental and physical health by attending wellness summits and retreats. Furthermore, we differentiate ourselves from the rest of the market by providing psilocybin-assisted therapy. This is made possible due to Oregon's recent legislation that permits the legal use of psilocybin in a therapeutic setting. Services like ours are not available anywhere else in the country and are difficult to access internationally. This competitive advantage, accompanied by our serene location and luxurious amenities, gives us a step above the rest of the competition. Now Jill is going to talk about our marketing strategies and operations. Our marketing strategies will include our website, social media, YouTube ads, and print ads. The photo is an example of something that we would advertise in a magazine ad. Our biggest presence will be on Instagram. This is the best way to target our market as we see a large number of guests being ages 21 to 30. The young adults are very heavily Instagram focused and Instagram can geolocate anyone in the immediate area who is interested in the outdoors, hiking, yoga, meditation, or psychedelic therapy and target them with ads. Now let's talk about operations. Our retreat will operate with one week retreats for our first year. We will have 12 people per retreat with one guide slash therapist per group. During our peak season, which is May 21st to September 1st, retreats will cost $5,500 and on the off seasons, retreats will cost $4,400. Our core staff will consist of Charlie and I. We will be accompanied by our maintenance staff and our greenhouse goddess who will maintain the mushrooms. Each quarter, we will have an accountant help with our financials. We will have an on-site restaurant that serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner daily for all guests and staff. Charlie will now discuss financials. So in terms of our sources and uses of funds, Julie and I will provide $25,000 from our personal savings, and this will go towards attaining our psychedelic therapy certifications, th so that way we can lead the wellness retreats. We will be also using inheritance from Jillian's grandfather. Now this inheritance will be used towards setting up the greenhouse for psilocybin mushroom cultivation, upfront repair and maintenance costs around the property, as well as an overhaul of the dining room and lobby areas. Additionally, we, will going, we are going to acquire a $200,000 loan from Chase Bank for 10 years at 6% interest. This loan will allow us to invest in solar panels as we aim to generate 40% of our electricity needs from solar energy. The loan will also allow us to invest in a backup generator in the event of an emergency. Our final source of funds will come from crowdfunding amounting to $90,000. We plan to attain 900 investors willing to input $100 each. The capital here will be used towards a starting inventory for the restaurant, some spa amenities, and the computers and phones needed inside the resort. We do understand, however, that crowdfunding is variable and we are prepared to start operations without the full amount we hope to attain. Next, we're going to take a look at our three-year income forecast. So looking at our three-year income statement projections, our revenues are quite high. Now, this is due to our high price per retreat, as we mentioned earlier. Our salaries and benefits will be paid to our full-time on-site medical professional, our maintenance employees, housekeeping staff, and cultivation manager. We also pay an accountant, like we stated earlier, to manage our finances each quarter, and we plan to increase salaries each year by 3%. As for cost of goods sold, typically hotels aren't known to have a cost of goods sold, but since we do have a restaurant on site, we need to account for 20% of our annual revenues as cost of goods sold. We predict our revenues will increase incrementally based on the amount national GDP is expected to increase each year. And in regards to the sharp decrease in revenues shown in the second year of operation, this is due to a $1.3 million investment in a large scale wind turbine to help us generate more renewable energy through wind power. In order for us to maintain cash flow, we will incorporate group discounts and package deals in the future years of business, as well as encouraging, encouraging advanced commitment with reduced prices for guests that book early. Now I'm just going to wrap it all up with our future growth. The wellness tourism industry is expected to grow with a compound annual growth rate of 7.1%. Because of this, we expect significant growth of our business. The first year will total eight retreats per month with 12 guests. Our second year will increase to eight, 12 retreats per month with eight guests. Our final prediction is for year three, generating revenue for 16 retreats per month with six guests in attendance. In the future, we see two therapists per group and different length retreats. We, are, we predict to have funds for five to 10 day retreats. There will be less guests per group, creating more intimate and stronger connections. And thank you all for your time and we welcome any questions.
Great. Um, I'd be happy to start with a question. Um, and also a comment. You said that your target market is 25 to 35, but the price point is 5,500. So when you said that that group has disposable income, um, that surprised me a little bit. So I would just encourage you to look at your target market. Um, but I have a little bit of a different question. I just wondered, you know, what would success look like to you? I mean, the, the psilocybin therapy is, is really interesting and it's pretty cutting edge. So I just wondered how, how you two would define success in this business. I personally would like to give people the skills like we talk about yoga, meditation and the importance of outdoor recreation. We want to give those skills to people so when they leave the retreat, we they have holistic self-care that they can put to their everyday life. And the psilocybin really helps you look further at suppressed thoughts that are bothering you that you didn't know you had and by acknowledging those thoughts you can move forward so we hope that coming to that retreat you'll realize things that are bothering you and you can move forward with it and cope with it every day with practices such as yoga and meditation thank you eight retreats per month. So how is that broken down? And is there um, a ratio of pronouns or how does that work? Um, so we are able to accommodate uh, 12 people per, uh, per retreat. We can house 24 people total on site. Um, okay. And having Jillian and I as each a therapist for a session, um, we are allowed to do two a week essentially and amounting to eight per month. Um, and as of a ratio, we didn't think of anything about that, um, but I think, you know, more first come first serve, um, but potentially doing um, a ratioed experience down the line if uh, if our guests expressed an interest in that. And then you guys have certifications in certain areas that you will be leading. Yep. So there actually is a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies and research, and this is offered by the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, this is a $10,000 certification. You have to apply, get an interview, and then get an offer from the Institute. Um, however, we believe this is fully possible for us. Thank you. And is that certification part of your business plan? Is it in your financials? Yes, it is. Yeah. Have you considered um, if somebody's using the psychedelics that they have a medical issue? Do you have... Um, health care on site? Yes, we do. We've budgeted into our income statement a salaried medical professional um, who will be familiar with psychedelic instances like that um, that will be on site 24-7 in the event of an emergency. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the judges and to Hopeful Healing, Jillian and Charlie. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. We have one more presentation before the break. We have the glass ceiling with Sarah Spencer and Devin Spindell. I'm just bringing up the slides now. All right. All right. We can see your slides. Sorry. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Go down. There we go. Perfect. All right. So it's great to present this pitch to everyone. My name is Devin Spindell, and my co founder here is Sarah Spencer. We are graduating seniors with community entrepreneurship majors. So we are a multifunctional spaced house inside of rooftop greenhouse located in downtown Burlington. With remote working becoming increasingly normal, how many of you all have been limited working into your basement or bedroom with no views, sunlight, or work workspace amenities? We address this problem. Bars and cafes currently on Church Street are unable to utilize the gorgeous views of Burlington's geography. We provide this. With such a special space created, we will also have the opportunity to rent to groups, diversifying our income streams further. 
We are unlike any business currently operating in Burlington. Our rooftop greenhouse design utilizes the wasted flat rooftops of downtown Burlington. This will allow customers unprecedented views of the mountains and lakes. The greenhouse will allow us to grow flowers and plants to give a natural ambiance. We will operate a cafe and bar providing premium beverages. Such a lively multi-use space will promote private network connections and will be a beautiful spot for private events. We have several different off or customer that will we will work towards. We have rumor, remote workers, uh, businesses, and employers. We will also cater towards weddings. We will work with local coffee suppliers and bakeries to produce our promote our baked goods. And we will partner with the UVM plant and greenhouse studies programs to supply our plant for the greenhouse places. So trends in remote working will continue to increase. 39% of jobs in Burlington area are able to go remotely completely. Small cities have been boosted their population from migration in the last year with Burlington seeing a 103% increase. Cafes lack the space and amenities to provide an office alternative. With such competitors as Vset, Hula, and BTV Works and Office Squared opening up recently in Burlington area, this shows that there is a need for such businesses. We have three different operations depending on the time of day. Monday through Friday, we will operate from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and will function as a workspace offering coffee and baked goods. From 5 to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday, we will transition into a relaxed bar setting with opportunities for small events, conferences, and networking. Weekends, we will still offer our cafe workspaces with extended bar hours, yet due to our beautiful, unique destination site, we will also rent our greenhouse site for Sunday weddings. So our floor plan will change during the day and at night. As you can see in the mock-up provided, there is maneuverable planters and tables that will be able to change the space as needed for the event and throughout the day. Majority of the space during the day will be will be uh, reserved for subscription paying customers and at night it will change as the as the nighttime we will change our operations and as the subscription workers phase out into the bar we'll open it up and allow for a, a place for people to enjoy their evening with premium cocktails. We estimate an initial expenditure of $1 million to buy our rooftop space, create our greenhouse building, and purchase our inventory, equipment, and initial salaries of our experienced employees. We will quickly earn back our investment due to our high margins, though through all of our offered products. We are asking premium prices for our goods due to the unique experience we offer. Our financial growth potential starts very strong, seeing profits already in year one. We're estimated with our multiple income streams already making a quarter million dollars of net profit. By year five, as we fill out the space to maximum occupancy, we are seeing that we will have a $1.38 million net profit. As we look towards the future and expansion, we will purchase a kitchenette where we can offer sandwiches, soups, and salads to our subscribers. We will also look forward to expanding more rooftops here in Burlington, but also across the nation. Locally, we also plan to open another site dedicated towards leisure that will act as a marketplace within a greenhouse. We are unlike any other business in Burlington, offering a new unique outlook on the remote workspace and cafe bar scene. However, our competition's, our competition's success proves that we are low risk investment. We will be receiving $250,000 from ourselves, friends, family, and the Vermont Small Business Loan. We are currently searching for an investor to provide $750,000 to aid us in the creation of this business. This investor will receive a 10% annual ROI or return on investment on an increasing basis through monthly investor dividends. They will also receive a partial equity in our business along with access to the best new workspace in town. At this point, we would like to answer any questions you may have. Can you talk a little bit about um, what your capacity would be? So, you, I, and also while you're at that, maybe talk about subscriptions. 
you're selling subscriptions to local people so they can go there and work and then buy food. Um, what if they hang out like all day? You know, does it blow out your capacity, you know, for other people to come in? Can you talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah, so with our capacity, we're a 2000 foot square building, which technically has a capacity of uh, about 150 people, but obviously that will be scaled back so that it's a bit more roomy. Um, we project in our, our in growing time that we will have 100 subscribers broken down in into monthly, weekly, etc. Um, and there will be an app where people can reserve. And so that will allow them to definitely have a space when they are going into the workspace. We will have this smaller cafe open uh, towards the public. However, to get in there, you must pay um, hourly Wi-Fi fees and you can buy that when you get a croissant from our bakery. Um, and so that's how we are managing this space. Great, just a real quick follow up. How much is the subscription? It depends on the time. Um, so if you are buying a monthly subscription, I believe I have a slide about it. It will be $200 for a month. Weekly is $75, $75 daily is $30. And if you want to buy an annual subscription, that would cost $2,000. Great, thank you for answering my questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was wondering if you, um, two parts. The first thing is, have you looked at the sort of the percentage of companies that are now going to all remote. And I don't mean just Burlington companies, but I mean people that maybe work in other places but live here. Um, so have you looked at the comp you know, kind of what the trend is? The other thing I was wondering, have you have you done a survey and asked your your potential customers what perks they would expect? Because I know that, you know, one of the things when you have a some kind of co-working space is you, I, you, you know, you mentioned a premium on coffee and um and other things. Um, so I was just wondering, have you done a survey of your potential customer to sort of ask them what, what they want out of a space? Devin, I'll let you handle this one. Yeah, so we have yet to do any direct market research on our customers, but through existing businesses that have succeeded, we figured that yes, the, uh, the, the biggest thing is cafes cannot accommodate everyone to stay all day. So this Dividing the space into subscription and regular coffees will ensure that subscription based customers will have their space guaranteed. And we we also think that will be discounts on subscription based workers on coffees. But the the real the real value of this company is the dual purpose of both operating as a workspace and normal cafe to bring in as much revenue as possible into the 2000 square foot space. Got it. Additionally, Thank you. I'd like to just add a little thing. Um, we're unlike any other business we're a glass structure that has amazing views which we believe will really draw um prospective clientele just through conversations with our friends family and fellow burlingtonites uh we can also see that there is an increase in remote workers coming to vermont due to the pandemic that we expect to continue afterwards as businesses realize that they can keep their business or keep their workers remote and we'll cut down on the actual businesses costs. Um, and so we see that there's a 103% increase in migration to the state of Vermont um, with a 39% of uh, Burlington uh, workers able to work remote jobs. Thank you. Does my membership um, subscription offer parking or what? Where? what is the parking situation that you guys are thinking about? There's a couple of different buildings downtown we've been looking at. Obviously, next to the building would be tough, but between Pine Street and other parking garages, I think we'll be able to work out a deal with the local parking municipality to, to have discounts or included into that cost for parking. Thank you. I just said, um, if, if there's time, I have one, one part that I'm a little confused with. One of your slides, showed buying a building and yet you're talking about the rooftop I'm, I'm confused as to whether you're just uh, uh putting a rooftop on top of an existing building and therefore renting it from them or you're actually trying to buy a whole building the most we likely are. case will be a long-term maybe 50 or 100 year lease on the roof of a building that will have to be upgraded so it'll be able to structurally hold the greenhouse itself 
So that's where the two hundred thousand dollars is the long term lease and then retrofitting the roof. And then on top of that, we'll have the six hundred thousand dollars structure. All right. Well, thank you very much to Glass Ceiling. Um, just in case folks are wondering why there were more judging judges questions this time around than there were in prior presentations. It's because this team finished a minute and a half early and because I'm giving every team 10 and a half minutes for presentation and Q&A. They had less time for present. They used less time of the presentation, so they got more time to backfill with with Q&A from the judges. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I'd like to go back and share my screen because as you will see, we are halfway through. Um, we've covered lightning blades, Echo Boutique, Bloom, Streets, Hopeful Eating, and Glass Ceiling. Next in the list is Carefree, Blue Room, Pitchfork Marketing, Able, and Repurposed Music. I'm um, looking at the time right now, and on my computer it says it's 5.48 p.m. Let us begin again at in seven minutes. So, Okay, as we slowly get ready to start back up again, if Carefree... Hello, Sarah, I can see you well. If Carefree could... Queue up their slides. That would be Alistair. OK, it's now 555. It's time to start back up our presentation again. I saw that Sarah is um, one of our judges is back. Are the other judges back? I'm here. I'm back. Wendy. Anna's there in masks. Sam's there as well. All right, great to have you back. Alistair, you Hello. can put up your slides now. Great. Okay, there it is. Carefree. There we go. Am I uh, good to go or are we still you waiting? You are good to go. Looks great. OK, awesome. So my name is Alistair. I'm a senior at the Grossman School of Business, and my brand is I, I've lost um, audio I've and visual. Lost, yes, I, I, Alistair, you're, it looks like you're frozen and we can't hear your audio. Oh, Alistair. Okay, I think we have temporarily lost Alistair. Okay, um, because we lost Alistair, I presume Alistair will get back here shortly. What I would then recommend is to keep things moving. Um, We'll, we'll give Alistair another chance when she gets back, but if we could move on to Blue Room with Liam Handron and Tom Cheevers. Are Liam and Tom here? Yeah, we're here. Okay, I know it's early, but if you could queue up and then once, once you're done, we'll see if Alistair's ready to try again. Sounds great. Sounds great. Sounds great. So Liam and Tom, if you could share your slides. All right. All right, can you guys see our screen? We can see your screen, yes. Perfect. Camera. There we go. 
uh, present. So are, are, are you guys ready for us to present? Yes, we are. All right. So my name is Liam Handren, and I'm here with my co-founder, Tom Shivers, and we're excited to introduce Blue Room. So your, your friend that study abroad in Spain, we all have one, probably had to find a subletter while they're abroad, so they weren't paying two rents at once. They probably posted on the Facebook class, reached out to their friends, and might have even posted on Craigslist, and they wondered why the website hadn't been updated in 20 years. On the flip side, your other friend that transferred to another school mid-semester probably had to find a place to stay. This is where Blue Room comes in. Our generation, we know that digital transactions need to be seamless and efficient for them to be practical. So our website is to improve that Okay, I we're having another freeze effect here. Just go ahead. Our web platform is a cutting edge platform where users can easily find a place to stay or find someone to stay in the room. This allows students that are studying abroad to save money. It gives power back to the tenant uh, by increasing their flexibility to travel and do things like go home for the summer to work. And it also presents opportunities for students to create new experiences with friends and meet new friends that could lead to lifelong relationships. This semester alone, there were 76 Facebook posts on the 2021 class page for UVM this year. Um, this semester, and then each year, it's an average of 1,200 students from UVM study abroad, while 2.1 million students study abroad annually in the United States alone. We had the opportunity to participate in the Binghamton Innovation iCorps customer discovery program this semester, where we went through 21 interviews with potential customers and recommenders that included students who posted on the Facebook page at UVM, directors of study abroad at large universities like Texas A&M, UC Berkeley and Harvard and also directors of student housing at smaller universities like Western Colorado and SUNY Plattsburgh. Our business model is to charge a 2% commission from the subletters rent each month and a $10 one-time charge from the person renting the room. So this would be an average initial transaction fee of $25 while it's 15%, $15 recurring each month. So based off only the 76 UVM subletters that have posted on the 2021 20, class Facebook page this year, that would be a revenue of $7,600. So our product is currently in development um, and our workflow makes it easy for users to search by city, personalize their preferences uh, to include things like their allergies to pets or allergies to foods, um, or what their typical Monday morning looks like or Friday night looks like, and also to, to upload their payment system so they can pay rent online and accept rent online. Our current competition, you may recognize some of the logos on this page. Um, we currently offer a more customizable, flexi flexible leasing agreement um, platform more than any other one of these uh, current businesses. So for instance, Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist, they are not customizable towards subleases, although you can post on the site that you're looking for a subletter, but Blue Room would be specialized in that. So you know that is the place where you need to go when you need to find a subletter for your room if you're leaving for the summer or for a study abroad semester. And so that is the place where people would find um, an affordable subletting option. So we're better than our competitors um, because we include certain perks like recurring monthly payments. So you set that up once and each month it does it automatically. Um, ID verification and background checks. So it increases uh, security measures. 
and then the hosts are able to upload legally binding subleasing contracts um, and have the subletters signed via e-signatures. Um, we have customizable profiles um, that make the site really easy to use, and we aim to be available to all college students. So based off, based off of our market strategy, we plan to go um, for exchange students, study abroad students leaving the US and transfer students coming into the US um, where there's a total more than 3 million total um, worldwide each year. Uh, so to date, uh, we have filed as a LLC in Vermont and been approved. Uh, we've created a business bank account and Stripe account. Um, our website is in development. It's just got completed with stage one of four. We've applied for funding from the National Science Foundation and we've created social media. And our next steps, uh, we're looking to enroll a soft rollout this summer that includes some beta testing on our pilot website. Um, and then once we have a handle on things, to, we'll, we'll be looking to market. So we're the right people for the job because we both have had more than five or six subletters in and out of our six person household for college housing, where um, we've studied abroad and we also have the know-how about how to make a seamless transaction being new age digital technology users. And that is it. Uh, are there any questions? All right, thank you very much. I'm glad the technology held out for us. Judges, your questions. <laughs> yeah, our Wi-Fi was going in and out, but I'm glad it worked. I think we lost you for a few seconds at the start, but we caught most of it. OK, good. I have a quick question. Our, um, our sublease is generally allowed. So like when you guys have an apartment, for example, are you generally allowed to sublease? Um, yeah, so uh, during my interviews, I um, asked some people about this and learned that most uh, places like Austin, Texas, um, the, land, the housing market is owned by a select amount of uh, real estate companies that do not allow subletting. They have a strict no subletting policy. But uh, in Burlington, our house does allow it, and I, I know um, that in a lot of other places it is allowed, although um, it is sometimes frowned upon by landlords. But um, I think our business uh, will try to accommodate that um, that issue by making it super safe and secure um, and having that be a seamless transaction. Yeah, so nationwide, the majority of leases will allow you to sublet. So we will have our people listing their rooms upload their original lease agreement where it will specify that they're allowed to have several letters. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question on uh, financials. Um, I caught, you know, you might have answered this already, but um, I did catch $7,600 potential from UVM alone in the short term. Um, did you talk at all about the cost you would incur to uh, build this and run this and sustainable that, you know, an ongoing profit and loss statement type discussion. Uh, yeah, so we um, currently are in development with the website, and so that will be our main purchase and my, our main cost is uh, getting that website developed. Um, we're working with a developing company called iCode Labs right now. And so once the website is up, I think our only cost will be marketing um, and fixing bugs on the website. Um, so beyond beyond the website development, um, I don't think there are much costs since we are a marketplace and we are the third party and connector from the between the buyer and the seller. Did you catch a price on the web development? What is going to cost? The web development will cost us uh, around ten thousand dollars. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so this is more of a comment than uh, a question, uh, but I think with your with what you just said, uh, I would have some significant concerns about 
being a marketplace and the insurance issues that you face if someone you uh, allowed through the marketplace does major damage in a sublet uh, environment? Because normally these are, you know, person to person who know each other. So you may have some cost expenditures that you're not anticipating. Certainly the bigger boys do have have essentially established an insurance program and there is a direct cost to that. Right, I think that's one of the the more appealing um, aspects of our um, platform is that the, there will be also a legally um, binding agreement that we will also model the insurance based off something similar to what Airbnb has done with theirs. What's your, uh, have you have you truly established a go-to-market strategy, uh, especially in the early phases? Because I, I, I will, you know, say that you can't boil the, <laughs> you can't boil the ocean. Um, so what, it, can you give a little bit more insight into your, your initial go-to-market strategy, where you're going to target? Yes, of course. So we are, um, Initially going to try to partner with uh, apartment complexes in college towns. Um, these are just some to name a few. Um, and by partnering with them, um, get their uh, users to use our service for subletting. Um, and then we've developed a timeline of, of when we're uh, gonna roll this out. I'm realizing now that you can't see my screen that I'm presenting, but um, we're gonna try to, we've narrowed it down to March and April being the big months coming up to summer uh, where students are searching and also November and December, uh, getting ready for the spring semester abroad. Um, so these are the big months where students are going to be looking to sublet. And so we've put together a plan to um, to market at universities, uh, to get people on our websites, create accounts, and get the traffic flowing. Um, All right, well, we have to wrap things up now. I think we have a general idea of your go-to-market strategy, so let's thank um, the Team Blue Room for their hard work. I think tabling will also be a huge aspect of that at local universities, or not local, but all universities across the country. All right, so with that, we have to unfortunately table the discussion for later on. Um, it's time to move on from Blue Room. It's back. It's time to go back and give Carefree a second chance technologically. So if Blue Room could stop sharing their slides. Hi, did we get uh, anywhere through before my uh, internet crashed out <laughs> last no, time? No, it crashed pretty quickly. So if you could just start from the beginning. Uh, all right, let's see. Hopefully, uh, I have the chat up monitored on my phone, so if it crashes again I'll I'll know <laughs> hopefully it will work with me this time if not I have the slides and I can share them yes yes can we see yes we can see it okay can we still see it we can still see it we can still hear you fantastic Okay. Take two. So, take two. All right. So, my company is Carefree, and we are unscented bath and body care accessories for people with sensory issues. And I really want it to be just a fun way that people who can't use scented products can be included in the fun sort of self care bath bomb and body scrub um, trend that's been going on. I also want to stress that it is unscented and not fragrance free. So fragrance free means that there is no uh, artificial fragrances or perfumes added to mask scent. Uh, and unscented means that there is no discernible scent whatsoever. So even in some fragrance free products, there are still strong smells like lavender or tea tree, which are natural smells and allowed in fragrance free, but won't work for somebody that is sensitive to smell. 
This company was born out of an unmet need in the market. Carefree's main customers are people with sensory issues and also people with special needs who may get easily overstimulated. So 20% of the population is classified as highly sensitive people who are extremely sensitive to stimuli, which includes scent. Um, and sensitivities like this are actually on the rise. So in uh, African Americans, the um, report of skin allergies, like allergies to perfume, actually increased, um, uh, doubled in a 10 year period. So we expect, you know, our customers to be fairly loyal because once they've found something that works, they're going to keep using it. And we're also constantly going to be getting new customers because more and more people are having this sensitivity. We also expect to have some customers who simply prefer unscented products and some customers who are attracted, attracted to the all natural and sustainably made business model. The competitors in this sector range from homegrown Etsy shops to large international brands, but amongst them, nobody has a full line of unscented bath products. So creating this line would make Carefree unique. Avino has one of the largest fragrance-free sections uh, of products, and it is still only 25% of their uh, product mix. And then looking at a more typical brand like Dove, we can see that that percentage of fragrance-free and unscented products is very, very small. So just taking a little look at the... Uh, Stakeholders, of course, there would be me and any employees we might bring on, and then external would be suppliers uh, and sales platforms like Etsy or an independent website, distributors that could be, you know, UPS as an e commerce business that could also be Whole Foods if we are going to retail, which at some point I would like to do. One thing I really want to point out in the business model is our customer relationships. I really want to encourage customers to talk to us, to you know, have conversations with us, give us reviews, give us feedback. And I wanna build that trust where they really feel like we are a brand that is listening to them and understands their needs. Um, and in that way, we will also create a loyal subset of customers who know us and trust us. For startup, I would want to raise about $3,000. I have about $2,000 of my own money saved and uh, the rest I would be asking from friends and family. I would love for Carefree to grow into a business that warrants large scale production. But until then, I would be and am making these products from my kitchen. Um, so to break even on all of the startup and then the shipping, packaging, and creation costs, we would have to sell about 450 units of our candles, which retail for $12.99, or 2,000 units of our lip scrubs, which retail for $3.99. For growth potential, um, I want to find where our customer base is getting their information. I found this a little bit just through my own <laughs> sort of research into this for finding my own pro products. Uh, and I want to market there. So we reach all the people that we intend to reach and we don't have to create a giant overarching marketing um, campaign that would be much more expensive. Um, and I also just want to say here, reiterate a little bit about allergies and sensitivities growing and that all of these people who are newly finding that this is a problem for them are coming across this frustration that 
I have and my mother has and some of my friends have where I tried seven or eight shampoos until I found one that worked. And then my shampoo company doesn't make a body wash that works for me. So I had to do that again. Um, And so I think that's really where I'm focusing is creating a brand that gets you all of those products from one place to cut down on time and frustration. Um, I have referenced some things in my presentation, so I do have work cited. I would be happy to share with anyone afterwards if they are interested in what all that information is. And thank you so much for listening, and I would love to take questions. All right. Thank you very much, Alistair. And thank you to the technology for holding out this time around. Judges. Yeah. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I was wondering, can you talk about what the difference is between unscented and natural? I see you reference natural products here. Would, would unscented products necessarily be natural? So unscented products don't necessarily need to be natural. There are ways to make unscented products, you know, that aren't. Um, personally, I prefer, um, natural products. And I also know that if we are marketing towards environmentally friendly and sustainable business, that is something that a lot of people want. Um, and it is also easier to make unscented products that are all natural because a lot of processed uh, chemicals and etc do have like a strong if not a perfume smell but a strong smell in general so your intent is to have natural products yes thank you Alistair have you are you the kind of person who's been cooking stuff up in your kitchen for years now and you kind of want to take it to market so have you been have you I know you haven't launched but have you been you know, giving it to friends and family and getting feedback. So where are you in the whole, you know, customer, um, you know, uh, discovery process with the actual product you will make? Yes. So I absolutely have been doing that. If this was in person, I would have had samples for everyone. I do have um, some lip scrub here, just in case anyone wanted to sort of take a look. I know that's not really helpful in a cosmetics sort of setting but um I've absolutely I've been doing this for years and uh I've sort of nailed down pretty good recipes for these four like original products I had mentioned which are the candles the body scrub the lip scrub and the bath bombs um and of course, you know, I've been gifting these to people and etc and my mother sister and I all have this problem and we've sort of, they have asked me to continue to make these for them, so. Great, thank you. Uh, Where would you start your primary marketing? Would you do it on the internet or farmer's markets or how how would you really get the ball rolling? Um, so I did intend to be sort of an e-commerce, um, website to start the ball rolling. Uh, I know that there are a lot of places on Facebook and Instagram specifically that people go to sort of share what products they found work for them and reviews and just sort of chat about how hard it is to, you know figure out all of these different products. So that's where I would start uh, and then grow from there. Good answer. I think that, you know, the internet can level the playing field with the big boys. You know, if you have this niche that you can meet, that's great. Thank you. How big do you want to make this? And besides some initial capital, which isn't a lot, what do you, what do you see down the road? Um, so down the road, I would love to get into a, a retail market. So I did mention Whole Foods a little bit, I think would be a good place for this niche. And um, also like moving uh, more into 
line extensions, I would really want to do that because once you have that loyal base of people that know that your products work for them, they'd be very willing to try other products that you're coming out with. And so branching into the soaps and shampoos and conditioners, other bathroom items uh, is really where I would like to take it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Alistair. Let's thank you. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> thank um, you guys. And now if you can you know, officially you know, stop sharing your screen deliberately as opposed to technologically, thank you very much. <laughs> it's time now for Pitchfork Marketing for Reed and Elizabeth. Hello, Reed. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Hi. How are you? Doing fine. Excited to Just hear you. Just popping up right now. Give us one second. <laughs> Great. How's that looking for everyone? It's there. Perfect. Looks good. Awesome. All right, then we are going to get started. Good, e good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Elizabeth Bigelow, and I am here with my business partner, Reed Browning, to present Pitchfork Marketing. So as New England natives, Reed and I share a deep love for the agricultural communities we grew up in. We wanted this venture to be purpose-driven and for our work to be fueled by the values of social responsibility and sustainable agriculture. With our educational backgrounds, as well as work and general life experience, we saw a gap in the market and an opportunity to help build a better future for the agricultural industry. Our pre preliminary research indicated a few trends that ultimately determined our market position. First, the COVID-19 pandemic illuminated an increased demand for outdoor recreation, as well as auto accessible tourism. This coupled with a struggling agri agricultural industry and rapid growth in technological advancements ultimately resulted in the creation of Pitchfork Marketing. So Pitchfork Marketing LLC is a marketing firm dedicated to servicing the agricultural sector of Greater New England. We work with each client to tailor marketing plans specific to their needs, as well as the needs of their community. Pitchfork Marketing's mission is to engage and educate the public on the importance of local agriculture while creating a sustainable business model for our clients in order for them to realize their full profitability. We offer a variety of services, including brand development, digital marketing, content creation, small business networking, and agritourism planning. Now, for those who are unfamiliar, Agritourism allows farms to establish themselves as destinations for education, recreation, and direct-to-consumer retailing. Visitors connect with the landscape and local agricultural experience while also providing farms with an alternative source of revenue. Projections value the global industry at over 115 billion US dollars. And while there are over 30,000 farms in New England, the majority of agritourism efforts are located in the Midwest. In Vermont alone, nearly 22 million people cross the state each year without stopping. An agritourism destination provides an opportunity for these visitors to experience New England's unique landscape all on a single tank of gas. So taking a look at our target demographic, we know that roughly 90% of farms in the United States are family owned and well over half are considered small or mid-sized. These farms statistically rely on external sources of subsidiary income. Agritourism is one of the fastest growing industries in rural America, and family businesses are often at the forefront of sustainability and innovation. The 2019 National Agricultural Statistics Service indicated that many New England farms weren't utilizing the internet for business-related activities. Despite having the resources to execute agritourism and digital marketing strategies, farmers and farm owners may simply not have the time or personnel to dedicate to these efforts. These resources I mentioned are provided by our indirect competition and Reed will provide a more thorough competitive analysis. Although Pitchfork does have first mover advantage, it would be ignorant to assume there's no competition. Agricultural NGOs own the largest share of the market by offering free resources to farm owners. Additionally, small marketing and creative agencies in New England also have the ability to adapt to the unique needs of this target market. Yeah, our research shows that their market share is relatively small and these competitors have few agricultural clients. Small businesses now more than ever can benefit from marketing specialists that understand their growth potential. 
The service-oriented nature of the marketing consulting industry implies low capital intensity. Technological improvements have made it easier for entrepreneurs like ourselves to legitimize their business without many of the traditional startup costs. Elizabeth is now going to address our marketing strategy. So our marketing strategy has three key components. We anticipate the return of in-person trade shows by 2022, and Pitchfork would utilize these events to develop a network of potential clients, continuing engagement through our digital marketing strategy. Leveraging search engine optimization, Pitchfork's marketing digi Pitchfork Marketing's digital strategy increases visibility, engages with the community, and reaches potential clients. Pitchfork Marketing's informal network is a key driver to our success. Marketing consulting is largely reputation-based, so building a strong network of clients, business owners, and community members is crucial. Existing agricultural networks is a lucrative opportunity to foster meaningful relationships in our community. In addition to a small marketing budget, low operating costs make it unnecessary to seek outside funding, minimizing risk in the long run. We are each investing $10,000 of personal funds as principal, providing a stable foundation for startup costs as well as cash on hand. Elizabeth and I are going to be the sole members of Pitchfork, both involved in day-to-day -day operations of all aspects of the company. Our business model allows us to work remotely and necessary equipment is very limited. So to put these costs in perspective, we've projected a three-year income statement that estimates our first year net income at just over $40,000. This reflects an estimate of eight clients over the course of our first 12 months. For years two and three, we anticipate a relatively steady increase in business given industry projections and low competition. A project-based tiered monthly fee approach best fits our business as well as the needs of our clients. We expect that revenue will be slightly higher in the winter and early spring as clients have more time to focus on time intensive projects. As new industry entrants, we feel we will be most competitive by keeping prices reasonable. Lastly, thinking about our long-term scalable impact, we emphasize the triple bottom line of sustainability, people, planet, and profit. We enable farm owners to create a sustainable business model for generations to come. Exposure to agricultural communities encourages environmental stewardship, and our business has ample opportunity to expand operations and adapt to an evolving technological landscape. Thank you all for listening and we're ready for questions. All right, thank you very much for a timely, very timely presentation. Judges. Um, I can jump in. Have you thought about um, getting like a guinea pig uh, agritourism business to, you know, really um, develop the concept and show some success to then further sell to other, you know, similar businesses? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, we currently plan on launching in 2022, uh, so we really intend to take the next year to become really experts on the agritourism industry. Um, and that would be like an awesome example of how to do that, um, is finding somebody within our personal network that would be willing to let us work with them uh, and kind of figure that out. Okay, and one other really quick one. Um, have you considered grants from government you know, like the Northeast Kingdom is undeveloped. And, you know, I know with the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers, there's a lot of grant money that goes out there. Um, have you considered that at all to, you know, to boost agritourism in regions such as the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont? We really have not. And that is um, wonderful advice and something we will certainly be looking into after this presentation. Great. Thank you. Nice job. I guess um, my question is a little bit of a corollary to that. Um, you know, obviously you're just coming out of school and don't have experience here. So how um, how are you going to compete with the firms that are out there? And have you considered maybe trying to partner and and have your services under the umbrella of somebody else to start so that you could be learning from them and utilizing their networks? That is certainly a possibility, uh, at least for myself personally. I've been working in digital marketing for the last two years, so I do have some experience, um, and I do hope to continue that uh, outside of school education um, through work experience upon graduation. Um, so again, you know, we'll take the next year to kind of figure that out, but I do think that you know, working with an established company may be an option for us. 
And just to add to that, in terms of the agritourism planning, there aren't many companies that are specializing in helping farms plan and create these uh, these business models. So we would have a lot of opportunity to kind of learn from the existing agritourism practices in the world and build our own plans and go from there. Um, I have one quick one quick question. So it sounds like um, you have not yet really had the chance to figure out what kind of the sweet spot is in terms of which farms, what size, what what products might be, you know, the best customers or have you already, you know, had a chance to I know you're going to do a pilot, but have you had a chance to talk to many farms about, you know, their reaction to your idea? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I would say that we have a pretty strong idea of who we want our target market to be. Um, and after doing some research, we do think that it is an achievable goal. Uh, we have a conservative estimate about how many clients we're going to be getting in our first year. Um, and fortunately, our business model allows us to be a little bit flexible if we don't reach that goal that we've estimated um, just due to low operating costs and low startup costs. Yeah. So we can definitely be flexible, uh, which we feel is, is a major uh, bonus to our business. Who is that ideal client? Um, the ideal client would be a small family owned farm. Um, so ideally under 10 acres um, and somebody who's really looking to diversify their revenue uh, through ag agritourism efforts. Uh, some farms may not have the resources or the time to do it themselves, and that's kind of where we step in. Thank you. All right, well, the, we have three seconds left, so I think it's, oops, it's time. Let's give them a, let's give them a, a round of applause. Um, I will definitely point out that you should talk to Dave Calvin because several years ago, one of the winners of this competition was actually in the agritourism business up towards St. Albans. So definitely connect with Dave Calvin if you haven't already on that point. Absolutely, we will. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Let's move on to Abel, if we are able now. That will be Declan, Olivia, and Carly. We most certainly are able. All right, we see your faces now, your slides. Yeah, so um, we, I just want to give a special shout out quickly to Professor Trisha Shrum. Uh, due to some techn technological and accessibility difficulties we're having, she's going to be sharing and scrolling through the slides while I give the presentation. All right, we can see the slides. Thank yes. you, Trisha. Are we good to start? You're good to start. Oh. Almost well. good to start. <laughs> Building suspense. All right, we're ready. All right, so good evening, everybody. My name is Declan Mayo, and I'm very excited to present to you our company, ABLE. ABLE is an online employment and consulting platform that focuses on connecting job seekers with disabilities to companies looking to increase their diversity of their workforce and help provide equal opportunity for all. So as I mentioned, ABLE is an online platform that helps job seekers with disabilities connect with large companies who are looking to increase the creative value and diversity of their workforce. I myself am someone who le lives with legal blindness, and I know how challenging it can be to go into a job interview and even look for employment with a disability. So many employers only see disability on a resume, and they automatically think that you are less qualified than other employees. We want to make sure that we are presenting companies with a workforce that is highly qualified and skilled based on the different obstacles they have had to face throughout their life. So our company consists of myself, Declan Mayo, co-founder and CEO, Carly, Ma Carly Masha, co-founder and CFO, and Olivia co-founder and COO. So at ABLE, we have three core values. We want to help promote equal opportunity for job seekers with disability while at the same time increasing the diversity of the workforce for large companies. We think that with these two goals, we can help facilitate growth for companies, both with their success and diversity of workforce and facilitate career growth for an underrepresented community of job seekers with disabilities. 
So some industry leaders in the online employment industry include companies like LinkedIn, Indeed, and ZipRecruiter. Now these companies combined have over 750 million monthly users, and the industry is worth over $200 billion. Now one key aspect that these companies and these websites don't focus on is making their products and services accessible to people with disabilities. Even a service like Microsoft Teams requires different ways to get around problems as exampled by my professor having to scroll through the slides for me. We want to make sure at ABLE that companies understand the needs of workers with disabilities and help break down those barriers and stereotypes. So our company, as I said, we want to help larger companies increase their diversity of workforce by finding valuable skilled workers with disabilities who have unique problem solving abilities. We also want to help job seekers with disabilities find a career that is suited to their needs, limitations, and wants. And we want to help these job seekers be as represented as any other minority community in the workplace. So our target market consists of 32 million working age Americans with a disability. We estimate that 11 million of these 32 look for a, jo a new job at least once a year. Our goal as a company is to eventually reach 20% of the monthly job seekers with disabilities. So this graphic here represents the opportunity gap between workers with disabilities and workers without disabilities. Now only 17.9% of the disabled community is employed compared to 61.8% of workers without disabilities. Now this statistic exists even with services like Indeed and we feel that our company ABLE can offer services and a in a quality and efficient manner that larger companies cannot. So our company works in two ways. It works in a business to business model and a business to consumer model. For the business to business model, we're going to focus on consulting services for companies trying to integrate systems for accessible accommodations that will be more open to workers with disabilities. We want to show them that workers with disabilities have high value to their company, and we want to offer that in a high in-touch environment for the companies. We also want to help job seekers find the career that is right for them. We want to develop an app that will help them build a profile consisting of education, work experience, their career goals, and their disabilities so we know what works for them and how we can best serve our customers. So our basic model for sales strategy works in two ways. We eventually want to develop an app that will charge users $10 a month for premium customer service features. These will include features such as resume building, interview training, and even workplace orientation to get them situated in their new career. We also want to work with companies on a consulting basis. We'll charge companies an hourly rate for consulting services to demonstrate how workers with disabilities can benefit their business, while also the different financial benefits that come from various tax incentive and government grant programs. So this is our basic model for our opportunity for growth. During the first six months, we want to begin developing our app and connecting with businesses. This consists of traveling around the country, different businesses, learning about what they need and what they think about workers with disabilities. We want to help break down the stereotypes that workers with disabilities are less qualified and show that they have unique problem solving skills that can provide long term value for their companies. During month seven, we want to start recruiting job seekers with disabilities through social media. We want to learn about our customers. We want to learn how they've been discriminated against looking for jobs and how they feel we can better serve them. During month eight, we would like to launch the first generation of our app, which will allow job seekers to create a profile and allow companies to post job listings where we can match the two together and find a career that matches. By the end of year one, we want to have consistent growth approaching that 20% monthly user rate. And we also want to really hammer home a strong market of companies that we provide valuable workers for their workforce. By the end of year two, we want to launch the second generation of our app, which will feature those premium customer service features for a small fee, and we want to launch additional features for the companies. By that point, we hope to have enough companies advertising job listings with us that we can charge them a small fee per job listing, which will increase our revenue and increase the value for the companies by giving them priority on our web page. So at, at this time, in order to cover our startup costs, we're requesting a $75,000 loan. Now this will cover the 
app development and building costs of just over $43,000. We will use $20,000 for market outreach and networking, travel expenses to travel around the nation and meet companies, find out how they serve workers with disabilities and how we can help them implement systems to better serve those workers. We also need cash to cover cybersecurity and insurance because our customers will be providing a lot of personal information on our app. And we also have some petty cash so we can hire more workers with a varied disabilities to help better understand our customer base and help grow our business. And we hope by the end of year two that I will reach a return of investment around $109,000. You can wrap up now. All right, I wanna thank everyone for your time and we hope that you join us at ABLE to help provide equal opportunity for all. Thank you. Let's go round of applause. Okay, questions for ABLE. I'm curious in those statistics of the, the disabled um, labeled individuals, um, what disability are we talking about? There's so, so this is, uh, so yes, that community uh, consists of everyone from visual disabilities to physical disabilities to even mental disabilities. In America, there's estimated around 64 million people with disabilities in general. Over half that population is above the working age, 65 years and older. So we're focusing on that 32 million that is of working age. And Declan, can you just clarify right now with the other websites like Indeed, is is there really, they are really doing nothing in this space? They, they have certain features that provide accessibility within the functionalities of the app, but they don't really do anything to really be proactive about helping people with disabilities meet their needs and career goals. A lot of these sites operate simply on posting a job resume and helping write notes to companies. We want to help our customers really focus on their career goals and match them with a position that fits their skills. Got it. Thank you. Yes, of course. Did you um, look into what government agencies may be already providing in this space? I know it's yeah, past so there holiday are... season we had um, a job position and Addison County brought in a trainer and they studied the job and then they taught the person how to do the job and then monitored. So have you checked against what the government already provides? Yeah, so there are several uh, government incentive programs for hiring people with disabilities. There is one that um, offers for small businesses, a small uh, loan to cover expenses for adapting their architectural and transportational needs. There are also services, for example, the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind that assists in job placement and helps monitor the situation. But what we want to do is focus on a nationwide outreach and reach a larger customer basis than the smaller local government agencies could. I have to tell you that I did this job for um, a little over a year and a half through the Howard Center, where our whole goal was getting people, and I like to say with different abilities, into a workspace to find um, life skills that would move them along. The hardest part um, that I found was without being able to bring somebody in with a a very noticeable different ability within a workplace, it was really hard to sell it just through paper or just online. So I, I'm wondering how you'll be able to make that difference through an what app. We're, we're, what we're hoping to do is eventually grow our own internal workforce within ABLE to hire the very people that we're helping. So we want to hire a workforce of diverse people of different abilities. And when we are networking and connecting with companies, by presenting them with the people that they're going to be potentially hiring, it will demonstrate their value and how they can better serve the company. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really quickly, um, why do you choose an app versus a website? Uh, maybe that's an elementary thing, but I'd like to know. <laughs> well, the main reason I choose an app is because just speaking from a visual imperative standpoint, um, a lot of features on iPhones, for example, are much better um, for things like text to speech and uh, different accessibility applications than there are on computers. Computers I find to be a lot, there's a lot more interference with the other software on the computers. And we wanna make sure that people with disabilities are able to access our application at any point with the accessibility features that best serve them. Great, that all really right. helps. Well, thank out. you very thank much. You. That was a wonderful presentation. As all of the presentations have been, we have one more presentation. We have to keep to the time. So thank you very much, Declan.
Thank you, Olivia and Carly as well. Now we have yeah, our final. Very much. We have yeah. our final presentation: repurposed music by Connor Fegley. Hey everyone, can you hear me all right? We can hear you just fine, and we can see your 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 slides just fine. Thank you, Connor. Great. Well, hey, welcome to repurposed music. As a musician, music is my escape from reality. It is my constant, my portal to creative flow and self-expression. If you play an instrument or have ever tried to learn an instrument, you understand how boring practicing can be. I'm about to change that. By reimagining how music lessons can be taught, I strive to make learning this life skill a fun and inclusive journey for all. This is me, Connor Fegley, and music is how I made it through COVID. From a young age, music composition and songwriting has been a defining element in my life. Using music as a creative outlet, I have learned to better manage my time and stress and find a deeper part of who I am, my sound. I study finance and entrepreneurship at UVM's Grossman School of Business, thank you for this opportunity, where I became fascinated with sustainability. I have marketing experience in a world-class technology and software engineering company. And for the last 15 years of my life, piano has been my unique contribution to the universe. Music is a generational talent in my family. I was classically trained by my great-grandmother, Graham, my grandmother, Mimi, in a school in South Jersey and during my career at UVM. I have extensive background in piano and music composition, and I do not believe it's necessary to practice other composers' sheet music to learn music. I believe music theory can be taught through creative expression to people interested in learning an instrument, improving their talent, or those who just want to create songs. At Repurpose Music, I am redefining how music lessons can be taught. Let's look at the definition of music. Vocal or instrumental sounds combined in such a way as to produce beauty of form, harmony, and expression of emotion. So I must ask, if music is an expression of emotion, why do we keep teaching people to play other people's music? You remember Beethoven, right? He is a true musical genius who learned to play from his, uh, learned to play piano from his father. Now. He created the sheet music. He didn't practice it. So I'm saying enough with the classical training and learning to read sheet music. I want to teach people to find their own sound and be more in tune with their emotions. I offer a personalized experience for every student using production level software for song recording and sound design alongside musical professionals at competitive prices. Additionally, I am an instrument collection and rental service. I believe people should have access to, en to any instrument, not just the hand-me-down guitars in their closet. Our membership subscription bundles both lessons and rentals at a discounted price. Under certain household conditions, music lessons will be free. I believe all people, especially those who are underserved, deserve a chance to learn music as a creative outlet and exploration of self. Now, earlier I mentioned my obsession with sustainability. With our repurposed instrument store, we no longer worry about creating waste. Here, we fix old broken instruments into fresh ones, and if unfixable for musical purposes, turn them into instra furniture. We engage local artists to create these collector pieces. Now, we will target music lovers within four different customer segments. Students, musicians, parents of children, and underserved community members. I interviewed 25 people within these segments, and the data shows their daily lives are occupied by time management, attending school, completing assignments, managing people's needs, and so much more. These cause a buildup of stress in people's lives. The data showed that over 70% of interviewees mentioned money as a pain, and over 90% struggle to find free time during their week. Repurposed music will relieve these pains simply by teaching our customers to play an instrument. There are many studies that prove music has a positive effect on the brain, increasing creativity and reducing stress. Now, there are also many customer games like taking care of themselves, practicing gratitude, and socializing with friends and family, all things music can provide to a life. Our core business operations include collecting and distributing instruments, which will be crucial in scaling the business. Customers then have a choice to purchase or rent from our uh, inventory. They could uh, take a music lesson with us, or they could purchase converted instrument furniture made by our local artists. For maximum creative freedom, a customer may sign up for our membership subscription. The general flow is simple. Advertisement and marketing material is generated by our front office. Marketing material consists of print, social media, word of mouth, or affiliate program, which will prompt a response from customers. After choosing their offerings, the staff prepares an invoice to be paid by the customer. All transactions will be done via email or an online platform for waste reduction purposes. 
The business will operate in Burlington, Vermont to start. However, I can apply this business model to essentially any major city in the US. So next, I hope to scale into Boston. Here, I have organized Burlington's competition by least to most threatening to my startup. Most of the competition have a great location. However, they lack this creative freedom I keep talking about. At Repurpose Music, we have attractive prices. Our music lessons are simply more creative, making for a more personalized experience. I strive to have a vast inventory of instruments from brass to woodwinds to percussion to string instruments, all in which can be rented. Something I have that these competitors don't is a sustainable repurposed instrument store. Additionally, I am the only one offering free lessons and free rentals to help underserved families. Burlington's market is rather large. The population of Burlington is about 40,000 people. 12% of the population already plays an instrument and 80% of those who do not play an instrument are interested in learning. This is about 29,000 potential customers. Now, assuming average lesson costs are $60 and average rent uh, rental costs are $50, with uh, three lessons in the year and one rental in the year, the market size adds up to about $7 million. Assuming I can capture 10% of this market, that equates to about $700,000 in revenues annually in Burlington alone. So looking at a financial model, startup costs equal about $55,000. Under the assumption I receive no donations, it will take about three years to break even. Although I find it unlikely I'll receive no donations considering the nature of Vermont. Our fixed and overhead costs total about 325,000. Luckily, there are many underestimated revenue streams to cover these overprojected costs. My three main sources of revenue are music lessons, instrument rentals, and membership subscriptions, which account for over 90% of total revenues. In time, I will introduce the Repurpose Instruments Store and begin selling sample packs. Students will allow us to use and enhance their sound and song ideas so that we can sell them to musicians and producers in return for store credit. This would allow me to greatly increase profits and allow me to easily enter a new market within five years. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure sharing my vision with you. And at this time, I'll open the presentation. Any questions? Round of applause for being perfectly on time. Judges. Nice job, Connor. Thank you very much. I'm happy to jump right in. If you can make music lessons fun, Connor, that's amazing. So um, <laughs> I, I, I get what the pain point is. What I the, the only thing I didn't understand is if I'm having a lesson, um, how are you actually teaching me? So am I with a teacher? Am I online? So the music lesson itself, what does that look like? Sure. So the curriculum is still in development, obviously, and I think I'm going to take a, a consultant approach to this where we could sit down and we'll see like what uh, methods work for you and I as an instructor and student. Um, and then from there, it's just this really creative, uh, fun lesson. And then additionally, we'll use uh, softwares or a DAW is what they call it, like Logic or Ableton or Fruity Loops. Um, and to me, visually uh, demonstrating how music works on this software platform is much easier than through sheet music. Thank you. You're can I uh, can I just take that one step further to what Sarah was asking? How will you replicate that as you scale? You know, as you bring on other teachers, how will you ensure that they're going to be doing the same thing? Sure, this is a great thing to, co uh, to consider. I think I'd have to start develop a, a curriculum for my music instructors and make sure they pass certain tests um, to ensure this. Um, but right now, the, just the minimum viable product would be me and maybe another instructor giving lessons until we figure it all out. Thank you. You're welcome. Was your business plan written as a nonprofit? Um, it actually originally started as that, but now I have hopes of uh, moving to a B Corp and becoming B Corp certified. So the donations you were talking about was people donating used equipment? Yeah, so it'd be like taking a used instrument and then maybe revamping it into a better instrument. And like I said, if it's unfixable for musical purposes, turn it into like a, I don't know, like a lamp or something. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. Great presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you. Other questions from the judges?
All right. Well, if there's no other questions from the judges, let's give uh, Connor a round of applause. And I'd just like to say uh, congratulations to all the other competitors. It's been an honor uh, presenting and competing against you. All right. Well, I, I see this as competing not against each other, but with each other, because there are so many good ideas tonight. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen so I could share mine. Now it's time for the fun to begin. Let me just quickly share my screen here to outline what's up next. Uh, if my version of Teams would actually behave the way it's supposed to. Screen three. OK. So as you can see now, we have. Multiple devices going off at the same time. Um, we are at that point where it's time for the judges to be secluded. But before we send the judges off, just a reminder about what the judges will be deciding. The judges will be first deciding for what you could call second place or best of awards, best pitch, verbal and visual, most launch ready in terms of working prototypes and preliminary sales, the most sustainable either from an environmental and or a social perspective, and then the most innovative technology, either a software or hardware or both. Um, and based on their four best of awards, they will be deciding on a grand prize. Who wins, you know, $9 million? Oh, God, to the the okay. Um, and at the, so if, if, if Edward, if you could send the judges off to the room, what I will be doing now in the, in the screen is for those who are still here, um, who've actually watched all the presentations and who want to vote on one of the key presentations, there's time for the People's Choice Award. And I will post this. Um, first in the chat is the link to actually the People's Choice Award poll. Um, I will also, for those of you who cannot access the chat or who prefer to use QR codes, I have posted the QR code for the People's Choice Award here on the screen now. And I will leave this up on the screen for the next five minutes, so from 7 o'clock to 7.05. And in this time, you can take a break, you can stretch, you can do that, you know, we've been sitting for another hour. You can, you can crack your bones, move around a little bit. And at 7.05, we will come back together for that panel discussion with our three amazing guests, Eli Moulton, oh, Emily McMahon, and Ryan McDevitt at 7.05. So let's take a quick break. I will leave this QR code and the link up on the screen. The link is in the, po is in the, is in the chat. Um, And we will get back in five minutes from now. Uh, just a quick question. I am sort of assuming, but that presenters are not allowed to <laughs> vote in the People's Choice Award. No, everyone's allowed to vote. Oh. I mean, it could be that you saw another presentation which you love all that much more. So feel free to vote. Now, the one thing I'm asking is when you get to the poll, as some of you have seen, I'm not only asking for your vote, but I'm asking for your reason why. And the reason I'm doing this is so that people have a chance to not only get their ranking, but also to get tips from the people in the audience. So I see we've already had uh, a number of folks. We've already had four responses, so the, the responses are building up. We have five responses. Now, of course, Alistair, everyone should only vote once. Um, I will double check after the event to make sure that everyone has voted once. You know, we're looking for clear winners, but I'll definitely double check. I can't check to see if everyone's voted once now, but I'm definitely encouraging everyone to only vote once. And of course, give you a reason why. We're already up to 14 responses. And we have three more minutes for voting.
Okay, if we could begin to wrap up the voting now so that we can shift back to our presentation, let me just remind you that we have on our panel discussion now, if people can slowly return to the panel. I see someone's raised their hand. Yes, I'm, I'm observing um, and I don't, because the link is on my iPhone, I can't click on that link to vote. So how do I vote? Um, so I, I, in other words, I'd have to, if I were on my PC, I could use a QR code, but since the link, the link was on the screen, I can't, that's not well, a hypertext. Can you see the, can you see the chat stream on your phone? The what stream? Okay, if you're if you're if you're actually using the MS the Microsoft Teams app, you should be able to see there's a chat function. And in okay, that chat function just... is where I posted the link. And if you click the link okay. in the chat stream, you should be able to vote. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So I will say uh, we have you know our three panelists right now who will introduce themselves in just a moment. I will turn off my screen so we can actually they will turn on their cameras in a moment. Um, this is new this year. In the past, we've had a you know meet and greet with drinks and snacks. We can't do this online virtually. Hopefully you brought your own drinks and snacks. Um, so what we'll do now is I will introduce our three panelists. Uh, the first is Eli Moulton, the founder and managing member of the Moulton Law Group which specializes in small business law and entrepreneurial finance. Emily McMahon, who is the director of marketing at Scout Digital, which provides digital media and online marketing solutions. And she's had many other entrepreneurial roles in the community, which she will talk about. And we have Ryan McDevitt, the founder and CEO of Benchmark Space Systems, which develops innovative propulsion systems and cube satellites. So I will stop sharing my screen so we could actually see our panelists. All right, we have Eli, we have Ryan. So Emily, do you want to, now it's time for the panelists to introduce themselves and tell them, you know, give a brief introduction to your stories. Emily, if you can begin and unmute yourself. Yay. <laughs> um, hi everyone, great presentations. Eric, thanks for letting me um, hover from afar. Um, it's good to see you, Ryan, good to see you, Eli. Um, I was going to say a little bit about myself. Um, so the two businesses I had started and founded um, pre-Scout uh, was actually Launch BT, which um, I know a lot of you um, avid pitchers uh, would be wonderful contestants for the collegiate competition. Okay, just a moment, Emily. Um, I see one of our judges is having problems. Um, Edward Glenn uh, is Glenn. Um, Edward will put you into the, in the breakout room in just a moment. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, sorry about that, Emily. Keep going. No, you're fine. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, kind of several organizations, I've had the hand in starting a lot of organizations and um, gotten to be really involved in the startup and entrepreneurial community in Vermont and New England. Um, really happy to continue that effort over at Scout Digital as the junior partner and head of marketing. Specialize in uh, digital marketing, outreach, lead generation, and really scaling marketing systems and go-to-market strategies uh, for companies in the area, anywhere from startups to enterprise. That's me. I'm all done, Eric. <laughs> okay, Eli. <laughs> all right. Hello, everyone. Um, Eli Moulton. I'm the uh, managing member of the Moulton Law Group. Um, I founded the Moulton Law Group about six years ago. Before that, I was a partner at uh, Merritt, Merritt Moulton. I've uh, been working here in Vermont for about 20 some odd years with early stage companies and entrepreneurs. Um, our firm is up to seven lawyers. Uh, we work with a lot of companies, starting from sort of the entrepreneurial um, cradle, if you will, all the way to an exit with M&A transactions. So our wheelhouse tends to be financing transactions. I would say about 50% of our work is helping entrepreneurs raise capital for their business. Um, and uh, on the panel today, it's great. I, I uh, I met uh, Ryan through Launch VT, which uh, Emily is in putting together. So it's a small world here in Vermont, and uh, it's great to all be on the panel together. All right, Ryan. 
Excellent. Uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, so my name is Ryan McDevitt. I'm the co-founder and CEO here at Benchmark Space Systems. Um, we build propulsion systems that help small satellites move around in space. Um, I got started doing that uh, as a graduate student at the University of Vermont um, and had lots of support along the way from great uh, organizations like LaunchVT, um, VSET, um, and the Office of Technology Commercialization at UVM. Um, and uh, like Eli said, I'll put in a plug, not that he needs it, but uh, he's been he's our lawyer and he's been a, a great help to us along the way. So excited to talk to you all. All right. Well, what questions do we have from the audience? If you have a question, please enter it into the chat, or if you have trouble visualizing the chat, feel free to speak up. I have a question for Ryan. Um, could you talk to how you became interested in space and moving stuff in space? That's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I did my um, undergrad. Um, it, it, I was a mechanical engineer, um, just happened to kind of luck into uh, when I do my senior project, uh, I got assigned to a JPL project doing small satellite propulsion, which back in, not to date myself too much, but back in 2003 was like not really a thing. There were no small satellites really, but we were just kind of like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we built small satellites and had propulsion? Uh, went off, did other stuff. I worked at Pratt & Whitney, worked on jet engines, other things. Um, and then I was in Vermont and um, Professor Darren Hitt, uh, got a grant to do small satellite propulsion. He knew um, my advisor from um, WPI where I'd done my undergrad and connected us. So it was just kind of like this, this serendipitous, he reached out to me and was like, hey, have you been ever thought about going back to grad school? And I was like, I was just thinking about going back to grad school and um, got uh, connected that way. Um, I, it was really just academic. I was just, it was kind of a fun experience. And then as I was graduating in 2014, um, the small satellite market just took off. There are now um, hundreds of companies doing it. There are hundreds of millions of dollars going into it. So it was just kind of um, right place, right time, and lots of great support along the way. Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to uh, put you in contact with my mechanical engineering roommate, who is just so happening working on uh, materials to be sent to Mars. That sounds great. I'd love to talk to him. OK, other questions from the audience? I mean, I'll ask some questions then, because you know that's that's my job as a professor. Eli, as a lawyer, what are some red flags? What are some of the simple mistakes that entrepreneurs often make that are that are easy for them to fix? Uh, not talking to a lawyer early on. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, uh, there, there is an element of truth in that. Um, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of pitfalls. I always say it's a lot easier for us to get involved in an early um, stage with the business. Um, certainly my firm and there's other firms around that focus on early stage work. We try to keep the fees reasonable um, and keep the cost down. Um, but and a lot of people avoid lawyers because of that reason. They think it's going to be too expensive. Um, but if you can talk to a lawyer, talk to an accountant and do things the right way, you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches on the back end. Um, some of the big things that we care about are, you know, certainly with any kind of technology company, we want to make sure the company owns the intellectual property. And uh, if you don't have written agreements with people who are providing services to your company, the company may not actually own the intellectual property being created. So having good written agreements with, you know, friends who are helping you, you know, create software or build a website, really important. Um, secondly, you know, choosing the right type of entity. I mean, your whole business is built within this structure. So choosing an entity that's scalable and that you can bring capital into. Uh, is really important and there's a lot of different choices there and it's pretty nuanced on which choice makes the most sense. Um, and, and then having good agreements with A, both your investors, if you've got early investors or uh, B, other co-founders. Uh, we certainly see a lot of companies come back to us who went off and formed a company by themselves. Uh, there's three or four founders and they all own the company in equal share. And one of the founders has left and is off doing something else. 
And there's no agreement that would recapture that equity. And that can create some lasting problems for the company uh, that, that will live with that company going forward and impact its life cycle. Um, so those are some of the biggest pitfalls. Um, and, and that's why, you know, talking to good advisors, um, talking to other entrepreneurs, getting a good lawyer involved, getting a good accountant involved um, are, are things that you should do. And, you know, certainly we do it. Other lawyers do it. Accountants do it. You know, people are going to give you an initial consult and talk to you um, without charging you anything. So, uh, you know, don't let the money aspect scare you away from talking to people who have done it before and can help you out. Okay, I have, of course, extra questions for Ryan and Emily, but I see two questions have come up. Two hands have gone up. First, Donnie, one of the presenters, has a question. Okay, he did have his hand up, and he's not. Donnie, are you there? Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Oh, sorry, my headset was off. Um, sorry, we are, I don't know if you actually saw the presentations, but we are building electric rollerblades, and we were invited out by a rep for rollerblades.com to go out this Sunday. We obviously have not had time to do our patent pending yet. Uh, we were planning on doing that this summer, which is why we've posted nothing on the internet. We've shown no one IP outside of this presentation. We've been as careful as we can because obviously we can be sh beat to market really easily by a company that actually has money. How worried should we be about events like that where we're not like intentionally showing off our technology, but if we are at an event with a representative, obviously we consider him a friend and don't think he'd do this to us, but you never know. Uh, well, one thing you can certainly do is use a non-disclosure agreement. So, um, you know, if you're sharing any of your intellectual property, especially pre-patent, I mean, the, the, you know, if you disclose your information publicly, it can jeopardize your ability to patent something later. So um, you certainly want to be wary of that. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're sharing any kind of, you know, what I would say, confident, truly confidential information, sensitive information rate related to your technology or what you're doing, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of good form NDAs out there and just, and people are, and people expect you're going to say, Hey, you know, we're happy to meet with you, discuss this, share this information with you, but I need you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, so I guess that's, a super, that's what I would and a super quick follow up. I don't want to take up too much of your time is on Sunday. I imagine at least I hope he's going to be impressed with our technology because we've done a pretty good job. If he asks that he wants to show, have us come in and show higher ups in the company, I assume we'd want to get a patent pending before we show anyone in that kind of a capacity. Or can we still be just protected by an NDA if we are going to a company that's specifically interested in our technology because they've shown interest before? With other yeah, no, I, mean, I mean, there's look, there's lots of companies out there that have trade secrets and technology that they can't patent for a variety of reasons. I mean, patent is a pre pretty narrow area. Um, and so so certainly you can rely on a well-crafted NDA um, to share information before before it's subject to patent protection. That being said, and I, I always caution clients um, that. The non-disclosure agreement, you know, you can have the best lawyer in the world and we can write the best non-disclosure agreement for you. But part of being able to enforce that agreement, um, if it ever came down to that, is making sure that you just dis disclose information in a careful way. And by that, I mean some non-disclosure agreements say that the information you need to be labeled confidential. Make sure it's labeled confidential. Make sure that you send stuff via email so you can track what was communicated to the other party or if you communicate stuff verbally, follow it up with an email and say, hey, as we discussed, we told you about X, Y, and Z, you know, that's really important confidential information protected by our, our non-disclosure agreement. That way, if there ever is an issue, you've got some evidence that you can show sort of what you disclose and it doesn't become a I said, they said situation. All right, with that, I right, see that um, Emily and Ryan have been nodding their heads and being very patient. I'm curious, Skylar, do you have a question for, Emily or Ryan? I do. I have a question for Ryan. Um, so I, I know originally you were studying engineering, um, and obviously now you're running a business. And I was just wondering if you could speak to the transition, especially in the early stage, from a technology to a business and kind of how um, maybe some challenges in your role going from what I assume was mostly design work to now what I, I assume to be 
mostly managing um, other individuals and teams? Yeah, it's a great question. It's definitely um, can be a big hurdle for a lot of kind of technical founders to, to make that transition. I'll tell you, I kind of took a shortcut, which is in between my uh, undergrad and my grad school, I bought a business and ran a business for five years. It was a retail store, um, ran it with my wife. So I, I kind of had gotten um, some familiarity with some of those things. Now, that's a very different thing than, you know, running a startup and you know, fundraising and, you know, scaling a team and all of that. So I, I wouldn't say it's an apples to apples comparison, but I wasn't starting from scratch. Um, the things that are applicable, you know, it's it, a lot of it just comes down to relationships, um, making connections to uh, people and looking for advisors and support. Um, you know, so much of this, I can remember very distinctly, um, I, I had one time I had to do a pitch um, as part of it was like a, a pre an angel launch VT. And I did it for um, David Bradbury, who's at uh, VSET. And he just kind of shook his head. He's like, okay, you're talking like an academic. Let's take this back to, you know, square one and, and I'll work with you on that. And, you know, all along the way, I've had people like that that have been able to help me and say, hey, you're talking like an engineer. That's not going to work here. You need to think more about the audience that you're talking to. So um, it's a process. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people out there that can support and are willing to support and, and know how to do that. Um, and, and then from my end, you know, the reason that I was an engineer and the reason I went back to school is because I love learning. Um, and so this was a great opportunity. I mean, right. It was a new challenge. It was something different. Um, and I just had to embrace it as, Hey, this is the thing that I'm doing now. So, um, you know, st still learning, I mean, you know, still got a lot to learn, but, uh, that, that was the path for me. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Other questions from the audience. I saw that professor Glavis had raised his hand briefly. Elanta, what, what is your question? Yeah, I didn't know if we had time, so um, so sorry. This is a bit. I, I teach the other capstone with Eric to uh, Professor Monson here. So this is just a question of the panelists: is like if you were in the students' shoes, and there's a lot of students here, like what is one thing you know, one piece of advice, one thing you wish you knew going into entrepreneurship? You know, when you started, you know, going backwards, like any advice you can give, you know, nuggets you can leave us would be really useful given your experience. And thank you again for being here today. Emily, do you want to start? You're muted. Got it. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think one of the biggest things I'm sure all the panelists on here and Ryan can attest to too is it's work. Um, I think, you know, you really have to want and be passionate about something. So I think what's really exciting is as, you know, everyone can kind of attest to you, you wear many hats when you're an entrepreneur and especially when you're getting started or scale a company, you will dabble in all of the things that I've done from marketing to business development to HR, and you'll be surprised how quickly that scales beyond your control. So definitely first advantage, I think, you know, if you're in a managerial role or if you started a business before, you already have an idea of what Ryan has talked about, about the level of complexity that can happen when you start a business. So you got to be really passionate and love what you do because it becomes really integrated in the life that you have. Um, outside of that, I will say that I'm finally at a point where I've built one of the best teams I've ever had. Know who can be your partners and know who's going to be your friends in business versus your friends before business. Um, it's a, it's a tough business to grow a company with people and they, you can't do it alone. So really know who's going to be those partners to help you carry that mission forward and really know what you don't know. Um, and really find those creative people that can bring, um, that expertise on that know something better than you, hopefully. Ryan? Yeah, my answer is pretty specific to, um, maybe not, but but I think it's a little bit specific to deep tech or like a, a harder tech, like a longer development process. But the biggest thing for me was just patience um, and understanding how much of it is, you show up that first time and you say, hey, I've got a great idea. And everyone kind of looks at you and they go, yeah, sure you do. And then you have to come back and they have to see a that you're you're going to stick with it like that like if they're going to partner with you they need to know that you're committed to it um so you need to be able to come back um you, you need to be you know showing progress showing momentum like demonstrating that so for me it was you know if i look back at the the process from you know graduating to where i'm at today it's like just these annual milestones of times that I saw people and it's like, hey, we've made progress since the last time I saw you. And uh, if I'd expected that all to happen in a summer or you know a few weeks, it just wasn't gonna happen. So uh, patience was the big one for me. Cool. Eli? 
Yeah, I mean, I sort of following on on that, you know, I would say my observation, you know, certainly I'm an entrepreneur and that I've got my own business, but I, you know, I also vicariously get to start 20, 30, 40 businesses a year. And I've been doing that for 20 years. So I feel like I've seen a lot. And the one thing I would say is it's going to cost you three, four, five times more money than you think. And it's going to take two to three times longer than you think. And uh, I have that conversation with every client um, and they all kind of chuckle. Um, and then they come back, you know, two or three years later and they go, you were right. <laughs> um, so it, it's expensive. You need a lot of the capital. You're going to underestimate it. And it takes a longer time than you think. And it's, it's fascinating because if you look at the companies that have been really successful in Vermont, in the venture capital world, there's always this dynamic of, oh, well, it takes five years. You know, that's what the VC wants to see for you to reach an exit. Um, you know, in my experience, that's that's an academic uh, wish list. And then practice, it's it's 10, it's 20 years. I mean, there's, there's some outliers where it happens quickly, but if you look at the successful companies in Vermont that have really been successful exits, uh, like, you know, a dealer.com, a Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Ben and Jerry's, you know, they were 20, you know, Magic Cat, they were 20 year life cycles. They were not five year life cycles. So. It's a long time, costs a lot of money. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Because the, I've just heard from the judges, they're ready. Um, they'll be coming back soon. But of course, if, if, the, if the audience has another question for the panelists. Hogwarts. Just a moment. We're, we're, we're just wrapping up the panel here. Hannah, any more questions from the audience for, for either for Eli, for Ryan, for, for Emily? Any parting advice, Emily, any parting advice for, for our student entrepreneurs here at UVM? Apply to launch VT. <laughs> I will encourage, you know, we've created quite the pipeline here um, in Vermont. And guys, for a really small community and network, there is no better people to get coffee and accelerate your idea and test it out. So any parting words, you really want to dial this in, apply to launch VT and keep going through the connections. You will not be disappointed if you're passionate enough. And there's a lot of resources you may not even realize that it can grow your company. Okay, Ryan. Okay, I, that's cheating because that's what I was going to say. But I, I'll say it more generally because, um, you know, uh, there are so many resources um, at UVM, um, in Burlington, in Vermont, and even in New England. Um, there are so many smart people. There, have been, there are way more people here than you know that have done amazing things. Um, they're out there. They love to give back. If you can get connected with them, show, show your passion, show your interest, show your, um, you know, kind of stick to uh, It'll, it'll matter, and people will, uh, will help you. Eli, parting words. Yeah, I think it's been said. It's kind of the theme of this whole talk, which is uh, we live in a great little uh, community here in Vermont, and uh, we have a great startup community. And so uh, take advantage of it. I, th I think that's the theme of our panel conversation. Well, definitely. Well, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much, Eli, Emily, Ryan. Um, keep in mind, participants, competitors, you know, if you're looking for you know, mentors in the community, these are some of the most amazing mentors I know. Um, they're, they've been, in the, they, you know, they're doing it, they're supporting it, and they certainly know what they're talking about. So let's give them a round of applause. All right, so now it's, um, Emily, so now it's time for the judges. We have the, you know, this was obviously a quick, relatively quick decision based on the history of this event. So I'm very happy that they, um, but we have some judges who've been in this before, so they know what they're talking about. So I will turn the floor over to the judges to announce First, who are the best pitched, the most launch ready, the most sustainable, the most innovative, and then the grand prize. And once the grand prize is announced, then I will add on top the icing on the cake about who has won the People's Choice Award. Great. Okay. So I am going to announce the best pitch award. And I'd like to congratulate Connor for repurposed music. Let's give Connor a round of applause. Thank you so much. All right, and I have the pleasure of announcing the winner for most launch ready and congratulations to Alistair and Carefree. Congratulations, Alistair. Thank you. 
And I have the pleasure of announcing the most sustainable. And that pleasure goes to Pitchfork. Okay. And for innovative technology, this was an easy one for all of us. I would like to announce the award to Able. Yay. I was going to give them a second if they were going to pop on the screen, but that's okay. All right. Oh, oh there Olivia. you are. There you are. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Awesome. So before we announce the um, the the one gram prize, sort of the, the the best of the four, all the judges wanted to really thank all of the participants. The presentations were unbelievable. I, I and I we are really not just saying that we've all done many, many of these um, competitions, but truly everything was polished. The graphics were beautiful. You all have amazing ideas. So we really hope that you will that you will pursue them and seek out mentorship. So thank you very much to all of you. And um, we decided uh, that the overall grand prize is going to go to Alistair and Carefree. And right, while, she's, while she's coming on the screen, Alistair, I'm going to give you one piece of advice and we can talk about it if you want another time. But uh, the judges all agreed that we think you should reconsider your name of your company because we're not sure it really conveys, you know, what you do. So take it or leave it. That's our advice. And congratulations. <laughs> um, congratulations. I'm, I'm open to name suggestions. Thank you. Okay, guys. Awesome. <laughs> congratulations. Great job. Thank you. All and right. So now yeah. I have the wonderful pleasure of there was a very clear winner in the People's Choice Award. I watched the votes come in and one 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 team very, you know, one presentation very clearly took the lead and kept the lead the whole time. And drum roll, please. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. And the winner of the People's Choice Award is Abel. Yay. Congratulations. All right, so judges, any words of advice, any parting words of advice for our, our students going forward? Let's begin with one of our newest judges in the panel. Let's start. Hello, Declan, congratulations. Nicely done, Declan. Congratulations. All right, let's, let's begin with Wendy. Any, any, any advice for our students going forward? And Claudia, yes, Carly and Declan. Just, just keep working at it and keep being creative and innovative. I mean, I'm, I'm so impressed with all of you. And you know, there, it was hard to choose among the group. So, I would say if you have an idea, keep developing it. I guess the only thing I would add to that is, um, as an entrepreneur myself. And write a check or you can do the work um, and as an entrepreneur you better plan on doing the work it's easy to say i'm going to get this money from the bank and this money from a friend that's not how it works you got to throw your passion into it not just in the marketing not just in the social media but also in the actual labors of love sarah yeah i would just say um if, if anyone wants other feedback on your presentations, you know, I'm uh, I'm happy to give it, reach out. My only advice is if, you, if there are people that you admire in your field who are at the very top and you think, I don't think that, gee, I don't know if they'd ever talk to me, you have nothing to lose. So I always say reach out to the most successful people in your field. They probably got there because they were generous. Yeah. Okay, Sam? Uh, once again, I'm just totally blown away by the quality of the presentation. Um, it just is so inspiring to me and energizing. I, I'm really proud of UVM and proud of the students doing such a nice job. Um, my, you know, my words of wisdom are in my career. It was like Hannah was saying, um, sweat equity was what it was all about. You know, I, I started uh, at a, I, I won't tell you the salary that I started at, but it was incredibly low, and. Um, just I had the passion and the hard work and I was going to make it happen no matter what. And along the way, um, you know, eventually I had to borrow at 
in the end, two two and a half million dollars. And that wasn't easy either. You know, I had to go through SBA and Vita and so forth. But um, it's really about hard work, passion, and following your dream and making it happen. And that's not easy. It's not as like going out and just getting money thrown at it. You've got to earn that and put, you know, put the passion into it. So great job, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this again. All right, Glenn, parting words? I think he had to go, Eric, unfortunately. Okay. Eric, yeah. parting words? <laughs> no, um, I wanted to, I, I see there's a, 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 there's one person whose hand is up. This is Marion Goodnight. Normally I would, it might be a parent. I'm, I'm curious. Marion, what, what is your question? Hi. I don't have a question. Um, I just want to say that I am a parent of a presenter and I have listened to each and every one of the presenters and I want to congratulate them. They were amazing. I am shocked at the maturity and the thought that went into this and I want them to pursue it. And uh, congratulations to the teachers and the guests who have inspired these young kids and make things very hopeful for our future. Uh, thank you. Thank All you. right, thank you very thank much, you. Marianne. No, we ha this is, I think this is the first that we've had a parent actually speak up at one of these events. So I thank you very much that this technology, you know, despite the, 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 the forces of nature which have caused it to, to use this, do this online, it's brought us together closer, not only with get judges who are in different parts of the country, um, but also with parents of our students who are happy to see that their UVM experience with the students is a very positive one. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you again to everyone who's helped make this event possible. Um, for the people who won, we will be in touch with you um, with certificates and we will be in touch with you shortly about your prizes. Um, for the judges, you will of course be getting a nice little thank you gift as well as the panelists will be getting a nice thank you gift. Um, we're good at UVM swag and uh, and hopefully we'll give you something we haven't given you already in the past. <laughs> I won't take it. <laughs> Thank right, you, Eric. So I wanna, if, if my other entrepreneurial uh, professorial colleagues, either Trisha Schramm or Dave Kaufman or Dustin Rand are here, do you want to say any parting words from your corners of the university? I'll just echo what uh, what Sam said. <laughs> so it's a terrific event. It's, uh, I, I think you said ninth year, I counted 10, but whatever. Um, we'll do it again because it works so well. It engages the students. I am, I am, as Sam said, just blown away by the great job that they do, the maturity they show, and the creativity that they have. It's all great. And that's part of what the UVM experience should be. So, so we're all good. Thanks, Sam, and thanks, Hannah. And the rest of you judges. But, I knew but you Sam, I've known for a long while, and Hannah is, uh, is a former student. And we're like this. <laughs> She's a better business person than she was a student, but you know, you never know, you know. <laughs> and and definitely, Dave, as I mentioned earlier, you have to hook a pitchfork with um the prior winner from St. Albans. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, you need to do that. That's yes. your job, Trisha. Thanks, and Eric. Thank you so much for coordinating. Wonderful, terrific job. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to Eric and to the judges because this is such a cool event that really has it allows our students to have something to work towards and focus on for the for the semester and really takes the projects to a whole new level. So thank you for taking your time and providing the opportunity and congrats to everyone. You're all winners. <laughs> I was so <laughs> impressed. It's fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much to everyone involved. This has been a great evening. Um, it's getting dark outside, and I'd love to get home to my, my, my chocolate lab, Willy Wonka. So once again, a round of applause to everyone, and we'll see you. For those of you who are graduating in May, I wish you well in your endeavors after UVM. And if for some reason you have an entrepreneurial adventure, whether you participated today or you haven't, or you were just in the audience, just in the audience, please feel free to reach out to the folks you've seen on the screen today. If not myself, if there is another person and you say, Professor Munson, there is this other person I wanted to talk. I'm happy to make the connection, happy to bounce ideas off of, you know, off the wall with you, as is Trisha, as is Dave, as is Dr. Moran, and our judges and our panelists. So thank you very much to everyone and have a good night and stay safe. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so Thanks, much, Eric. judges. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eric.
Thank well you, done. Thank you. And of all, thank you, Marianne. Thanks, Dave. I'll see you soon. See you soon. Good night, folks. <laughs>